2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Would you please join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the roll call from the clerk, please. Chairman Garvin. Here. Councillor Grennan. Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor Ray. Here. And Councillor Sullivan. Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll start off with town council reports and correspondence. Is there anybody that wishes to offer a report? Councillor Jordan. Um, I'd like to um, mention that the uh, comprehensive plan uh, planning group, we have, um, if you go to the capeelizabeth.com uh, website, you'll see questions out there, and we're going to do a question like every month, and this is one way of us to start to really engage the community in the development of the comprehensive plan, so I hope that everybody uh, will take the opportunity to go to the website and, um, and, and log their comments, and like I said, each month it's going to be uh, a different question. The next meeting of the comprehensive plan and uh, is this Wednesday uh, in the uh, William Jordan Conference Room at 7 o'clock. Um, and we're currently working on developing the, uh, a survey. So the more engaged and involved we keep the citizens, the better comprehensive plan we can develop. Thank you. Any questions for Councilor Jordan? Other reports or correspondence? Councilor Grennan? Uh, yes, I just wanted to let you all know that the next meeting of the Ordinance Committee is tomorrow, Tuesday, July 11th from 12 to 2 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Any other reports? Councilor Sullivan. Uh, yes, um, we all received uh, correspondence today uh, from current Fort Williams Park Committee member Jim Walsh, also former town councilor alerting us to a very interesting article uh, that was in Sunday's paper uh, regarding Acadia and the stresses that park is going through. Um, and I think there are some fascinating parallels to what we are uh, uh, going through with Fort Williams. And so I want to thank him for forwarding that to us. I did see it. I thought it was outstanding. And we certainly urge council and then members of the public to read through that if they haven't had a chance already. It's, it really has some very interesting parallels to the stresses. I also think it's very interesting, the concept of resource protection versus recreation. And I, it's a fascinating read, so please do get the chance if you can. Thank you. Um, I'll take the opportunity to dovetail on that. Um, I don't know if you were going to address it in your manager's report, so I don't want to steal your thunder. But um, uh, Matt and myself, uh, the chairman of the Fort Williams Park Committee, Mark Russell, and staff, uh, staff advisor um, Bob Malley met uh, several weeks ago um, for just an initial conversation about charting a path sort of forward relative to some of the ongoing uh, growth and management issues uh, at Fort Williams. One of our goals as a council for this year, uh, as it was last year, continues to be, is to look at um, really the long-range strategy and, um, uh, you know, some of the issues around uh, use and cost and, um, you know, as Jessica kind of alluded to, how to best protect um, the resource and asset um, for the many years to come. So uh, the outcome of that is that we're going to be convening, I think, a series of meetings both with the council and the committee as well as a number of other interested stakeholders, uh, um, neighbors, other folks from town, et cetera, um, to begin uh, really an ongoing dialogue uh, focused on developing solutions to, um, you know, really uh, ha having, having best laid plans in, pl in place um, uh, for the years to come. So thank you for bringing that up, Jessica. Uh, any other reports or correspondence? Great. Uh, we'll go to the finance committee report. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, before I get into the dashboard, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention the June 13 uh, school validation vote. I want to thank members of the town council and the school board for what I thought was a, a very healthy and robust discussion. Um, as most of you know, uh, that the budget amount that was sent uh, to the voters did pass 
631 to 487. And the non-binding expression, uh, 542 felt it was too high, 400 felt it was acceptable, and 157 felt it was too low. So we're done this year, and we'll stay tuned for next year. <laughs> so the dashboard you all have in front of you, um, <laughs> I'm uh, going to probably need Matt's help because we reviewed this together, and I left my notes at home by mistake. But anyhow, uh, I think the biggest news is... Uh, the continuing uh, increase in excise taxes and building permits, which are up 200%, so twice what was the predicted amount that we'd be receiving. Um, we did talk about the uh, police overtime budget last month, but that's coming in under budget, just squeaking in under budget as it turns out, but under budget nevertheless. Um, and so, Matt, could you just mention anything else that I'm forgetting without my notes? Sure, sure, Councilor Sullivan. Uh Part of it, uh, it is uh, it is good news. Police overtime came in $111 under what was forecast. So uh, we were concerned at one point that it was going to overshoot, but it did it did fine. Uh, Public Works also their overtime came in under budget. Uh, health insurance came. Uh, we had uh, less to expend on health insurance this year as we did and uh, as we had forecast. It was good news. Uh, and again, uh, yeah, buoyed by our building permits, which. We had anticipated $125,000 in revenue. It ended up coming in at 250. Uh, there are some large projects that contribute towards that. Uh, principal among them is the expansion of the Inn by the Sea. It was a very large ticket revenue item as far as building uh, permits as well as uh, uh, the chiropractic center that's being uh, constructed in the center of town. So those are two of the larger, more substantial building permit fees we had. Uh, but those are uh, you know, out outliers. Uh, but ultimately, by the end of the year, uh, one other item of note is that SALT budget. We came in at roughly just under 70% of what we anticipated. And you think about the year that we had for a winter, that you'd think that we would have been close to or above where we were at. But um, our sand was sand and SALT both came in at decent numbers. Uh, so uh, that's, that was a pleasant surprise at the end of the year. So overall, the fiscal health of the town is very good as we get to the end of the year and we start our next fiscal year. So we're starting off on very, very sound footing to move forward. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Uh, at this point, um, if there are any citizens here that wish to speak about anything that is not on tonight's agenda, now is your opportunity to do so. Please come forward to the podium if you'd like to. That's anything that's not on tonight's agenda. Seeing none, we'll move to the town manager's monthly report. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know there's many items on the agenda that, that folks want to uh, do business on tonight. I just want to state that the past month was very active uh, with many projects underway, plans being finalized, and the end of the fiscal year here. The transfer station construction, construction project is in full swing with the initial paving installed, concrete work in place, and additional site work underway. The compactors are arriving on site this Wednesday, which is exciting as uh, that's, that's huge progress. We're currently planning on a closure on July 26th, and that is in order to finish, uh, to, to complete our finished paving and get that final layer on. Uh, we will try to make sure that the public is very well informed of that, but I was talking with the Public Works Director Bob Malley today and wanted to get that date out as soon as we possibly could, so you'll see more information about that. But uh, during that time, we will have alternative means of disposing of uh, waste disposal, and that'll be near the salt shed where the current silver bullets are. And all of this, unfortunately, is weather permitting uh, as far as paving goes, because you can't pave when it's raining. But uh, but be advised, it'll be it'll be the end of this month. The completion of this project is scheduled for early August, and we are on track to meet that timeline. So uh, that's some great great progress going forward. This Thursday, the bids will be open for the Scott Dyer and Hill Way reconstruction project, and that will be at 2 p.m. right here in the council chambers. We'll also be opening bids for a uh, street sweeper replacement and irrigation project at the Ray Moulton Fields, which are over on Scott Dyer Road, the baseball, fields, uh, right, baseball field over there. I participated in the hiring process of the facilities and transportation director with representatives from the school department. And after performing interviews with a strong pool of candidates, a selection was made, and I'm happy to announce that our new director is Perry Schwartz, uh, who started today. And nobody could be more happy about that than I am. 
Uh, speaking of facilities, I want folks to know that the Cape Care Playground reconstruction project was completed today, uh, which again is really cool. It's right down in the corner. It's good for the little kids. Uh, there's some, they, they're already jumping on the swing sets over there. Uh, there's some really nice effects that they, they seem to embrace immediately. Uh, there's also a slide which was finalized today. Uh, we'll be taking photos of the playground and getting them on the website shortly. Uh, we want to get some kids in the act of actually enjoying it. Uh, so I think that'll look nice. Some very fun equipment installations, and the kids will really enjoy it. Uh, as uh, Chairman Garwin had noticed, noted, we met with Mark Russell and Bob Malley regarding, the, uh, regarding Fort Williams and the myriad of issues that are surrounding. Uh, the surrounding the park and next month we will have an item on the agenda to set a date for a workshop with with the Fort Williams uh, Park Committee and so look forward for that and previews of coming events and I did have the opportunity to meet with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust Board of Directors two weeks ago it was a great meeting with their group I look forward to working with them and in August I'll be attending the main town and city managers New England Management Institute at Sunday River uh, of note, there will be some educational sections on collective bargaining, road preservation, and employment issues in a changing employment environment. And on Thursday night, uh, this week, I'll be attending the Harbors Committee. Uh, to this, and at that meeting, we'll, we will have representatives from the state there, which is great. We have them confirmed and talking about uh, access to the beach down at Kettle Cove as well and, uh, and the Crescent Beach Harbor-related issues. So uh, looking forward to that meeting as well. Uh, they couldn't come last month, and with the state shutdown, uh, issues that were taking place. We weren't sure if they were going to be able to confirm, but everybody voted. They took care of the state budget, and they're back in business. So they'll be there on Thursday night. So um, that is all I have to report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Matt? Great. Uh, next up is the review of the draft minutes of the June 12, 2017 meeting. I'll be looking for a motion to approve the minutes. Council Sullivan. I move that we approve the draft minutes of June 12, 2017. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor London, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. First up is item number 100-217, Paper Street Technical Assessment. Um, you guys, I'm sure, all remember that last fall, uh, at my request, um, we asked the um, Conservation Committee um, with the assistance of town engineer and Sebago Technics to conduct a technical assessment of uh, a few uh, of the paper streets um, that were included in our review of paper streets last fall and uh, come back to us uh, with their assessment uh, in the form of a report on feasibility uh, surrounding potential trail building uh, on those paper streets given that those were the um, reasons and rationale given for um, the recommendation at the time, both the Planning Board and the um, Conservation Committee, uh, to at least extend the town's rights to those paper streets. So um, we've received that report. Um, so the item on the agenda here is to recommend uh, acknowledging receipt of uh, the report. Um, I'm happy to give um, Maureen, or I see Jim Tassi here as uh, chair of the committee, Either of you wants to come forward to preface anything. We'll also have an opportunity. I see a lot of people in the audience, um, I assume, that are interested in talking about this. Um, so there will also be public comment opportunity. But uh, if you'd like to introduce it first, Chairman Tassi. Sure. Thank you. No. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me up. Uh, the Conservation Commission received the charge from the Town Council to review the technical feasibility of installing trails at both Surfside, uh, Atlantic Place, and down on Lighthouse Point Road. Uh, the assessment of the town engineer was that there are no uh, significant technical obstructions to putting in trails that are consistent with the style that we see throughout Cape Elizabeth at those locations. The Conservation Commission um, accepted the Sebago Tech report um, which we felt was balanced, thorough, and uh, made appropriate reference to state agencies regarding permitting and the process that would be necessary to put in such a trail. Um, you have a copy of that report. You have a copy of our letter that says um, we agree with the findings of the report. Uh, you should note that although um, there are no technical feasibility uh, issues to installing a trail, 
the Conservation Commission at this time is not interested in putting a trail at either location, but we do strongly urge that the town maintain its rights to the paper street because really the, the work of a conservation committee and of a town in general, is, it's a long game. And so, although at this point in time, it may not be um, desirable to install trails in either or both locations, down the road, conditions may change and it may be appropriate to uh, reconsider putting a trail in at such time. So although uh, there are no technical challenges to putting in such a trail, uh, and although particularly the Surfside Avenue Trail uh, does conform and, uh, to and meet a number of the goals outlined in the Greenbelt Management Plan, uh, we have no intention of putting a trail in, but we do urge the uh, council to maintain the town's rights to those paper streets um, in the event that it's a uh, future moment, uh, it becomes you know, feasible and desirable to put in a trail. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point for Chairman Tassi? You want to ask? I would like to thank you uh, and the committee, um, as well as the engineering firm, for completing the work. Appreciate it. Appreciate um, all the time and energy that was put in on it. And um, if you could convey that to your fellow committee members, that would be great. I certainly will. We're meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there members of the public that wish to speak on this issue? If there are, please line up at the podium. I'd ask that you limit your comments to about three minutes, of which time I will keep here. Um, we'll try and have the public comment period um, last for about 15 minutes. If there are comments that you're um, uh, if you could keep your comments specifically directed to. I'm sorry. Hello. Okay. I know. Our mics aren't on. Okay. Hold on one second. Is, is that mic on? No. No mic on. Thanks for telling us, otherwise we wouldn't know. <laughs> Isn't this supposed to be Yeah. I think so. Is it okay if you pass this on the out? Sure. Sorry, I didn't realize they, didn't realize they weren't on. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe the same engineer that's managing, I don't know, Casco Bay Bridge is taking care of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can work that for Can you imagine? <laughs> that is stressful. I really like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Testing. Hello. We'll just okay. to shout. Do we have that wire? All right, it seems like we're having a little bit of technical difficulty with the mics, so I'll ask that um, counselors, I, I can't tell if it's on at all. Or not. Okay. Okay. Can you hear us if we talk like this? Yes. So if everybody could just 
project, enunciate, that'd be great. So. Hi. Good evening. My name is Andrea Adams. My husband, Bruce Dunphy, and I live on um, 25 Algonquin Road Extension. We've lived there for 29 years. We've been Cape residents for 32. I am here representing Ocean View Association. We are the association that is, has seven members. We live, and I've given you a map, it's highlighted. So we only are on the portion that's highlighted in yellow. We have Surfside Ave, gravel portion, and Algonquin Road Extension. So there's seven of us that live on that area. I think there's been a lot of controversy because no one really understood when you said Surfside Ave, they didn't really know what it was. According to the May 30th Sebago Technic Survey Report, on page two, it says that there is no apparent owner of that area. And attached to what you've got is the deed that shows that in 1991, our association bought the land, the road that's on the side, the gravel road, and the land from the road to the ocean. It's the U-12 map in the town. And I got it from upstairs. Um, this is erroneous because when they say in their, in their plan there's no apparent owner, we do own the land. We do on the road. And I've submitted this many, many times to the Conservation Committee, and no one's ever gotten back to us about anything. Um, there's 943 feet that we are talking about. It's less than one fifth of a mile. I can't imagine how much time and energy and expense has been spent on this for the past five years for 943 feet. Um, we purchased the land in 1991 from the, from the Sure Acres Land Company, which was the original developer from Sure in Sure Acres. We did it legitimately. We hired lawyers. We've got a deed. It cost us a lot of money. We have maintained that road for decades. Prior to me, living there for 32 years, 29 years, there are people here who can tell you they've lived there for much, much longer. The town has never stepped foot on a road. You've never maintained it. You've never wanted it. We've, we've, we've plowed it. We've filled the potholes. We've fixed it. And you've just never wanted it. So now, all of a sudden, the town says they can just take it and make it into a Greenbelt Trail. Um, I think that we're just asking you to vacate because you're talking about 900 now, Charlie Scammon is here, and I have to ask if I can speak to him, because Charlie is, doesn't really want to speak, but I think that Charlie wants to hand you a map and show you where he owns, because in the Greenbelt Plan, it talks about connectivity, and it says that you have to connect trail to trail to trail. Charlie owns what you can see in the pink highlighted area. Charlie owns the land that connects the top of the Pilot Point Road to Broad Cove. And in the, in the um, Greenbelt Plan of 2013, it says, sometimes the town initiates contact with the property owner regarding public access, access rights. If the property owner is not interested in donating or selling public access rights, no further action by the town is taken. Charlie, will you ever connect contact by the town about the Greenmill plan? No. On page 17 of the same plan, it says if a property owner is not interested in locating a, put my glasses on, locating a trail on their property, the town will accept their decision and consider other locations. Charlie, you ever ask about anything? So on page 25 of the same plan, it says, regarding connectivity, quote, the third and most important issue is to expand connectivity, to make connections with other trails and keep people off the main roads. 
if you look at that map, it, the, the initial map that I gave you, it ends where, you're, where the, the yellow part ends. I think it's John. Look at the lot number. Oh, oh, I got it here. I got it here. My glasses on. It, it ends at um, lot 56 on that original map. So if you go up Algonquin Road Extension, that is a road that seven homeowners use to get into their homes. That's a main road. There are two homes that use Surfside Ave, lot 61 and 62, that have driveways to get into their property. So that's, that's another road that's used. How can you have a trail where people are going to be driving into their homes and you're going to be allowing people to walk this road? Sebago Technics stopped their survey at lot 62. When you read the plan, you'll see it never went further. And we don't know why. We've asked. We've sent emails. We asked the Conservation Committee. They never responded. We don't know why the survey ended at Lot 62. One third of Surfside Ave. It's two thirds of Surfside Ave that's not even in the report. Okay? Charlie, you want to say something? Charlie, how long have you lived in Cape Elizabeth? Um, my parents left the house 53 years ago. He lives in Scammon Circle in Rockville. Great. Thank you. Chairman Garvin, could we remind folks that there's a three minute limit? Because we're going to be here all night and we have that a lot of other That was exactly time. six minutes for the two individuals, the one that, for you. whom she was speaking. So I'm keeping the time here. So Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is uh, Jeff Alexander. Uh, I will be brief. I basically have two points to make. Um, but as a preface, it's important for the council to understand that obviously you have heard and you will hear passionate feelings about this whole Greenbelt controversy. Um, and I come at this as a 23-year uh, resident of Shore Acres. Uh, so I've been there long enough to know how this path has been used to watch neighbors come and go. Uh, and most importantly, I live at 31 Reef Road. So if you look at you'll see that I have no axe to grind here whatsoever. Whether there was a green belt uh, or public paths, frankly and selfishly, it really doesn't make any difference to me. But I am a longtime resident of Shore Acres, and uh, as a result, I have seen what this controversy, frankly, has done to our neighborhood, which is really uh, shameful in many ways. Uh, one of the arguments that has been made in, to support the idea of this disconnected little stretch of Greenbelt is that this neighborhood is somehow underserved. Okay, well, I think everybody in this room has probably been to Shore Acres at one time or another. We are blessed with one of the most prominent uh, accesses to the public and vistas, and it's called Trendy Point. Uh, we have uh, public access to that, which is used heavily. It's been used as long as I've been there, even, frankly, when it was not owned by uh, the, uh, the town. Uh, so, you know, this underserved argument really just falls flat if you think about it pragmatically. The last point that I want to make, because I know there are a lot of people that are here tonight, is uh, when I moved into Shore Acres, uh, we had a very vibrant Shore Acres Neighborhood Association. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, the Neighborhood Association has atrophied simply over this issue. I, for one, am a happy and proud resident of Shore Acres Neighborhood, but I no longer am a member of the association because I feel that it's gone in a direction which does not represent uh, a number of folks. So it's important for this council to understand that there has never been a formal, viable, and defensible survey or poll of all the members of the Shore Acres neighborhood as to whether or not we are in favor of this. Now, for all I know, the association may have had a poll and it may have been in favor, but that does not represent the neighborhood. That's important to know. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is John Perrin, and I am a resident of 8th Surfside Avenue uh, at, Sh at uh, Shore Acres. And I'm reading a letter composed by Shore Acres uh, resident Richard Geyer, who is not able to attend tonight. And it reads as follows. To Cape Elizabeth Town Council, from Janet and Richard Geyer, Algonquin Road, Shore Acres. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what prompted me to put my thoughts on paper today and to share them with you, but on a beautiful day like this, I noticed quite a few out-of-state cars in the neighborhood. I have no desire to deny anyone a quick visit to the ocean, but when they start blocking up the roads, I get a bit cranky. My concern grows when I think of the tentative plans for a Greenbelt Trail along the rocky coast. I understand that a new trail would be on a map that invites even more people to visit. I have written before to express my concerns for the welfare of walkers and how a town or property owners might fare in a lawsuit that arises from a serious accident. Now, add to this the costs that will be incurred by the time this project gets argued, brackets, in court, question mark, closed brackets, and built with the necessary safety enhancements and then maintained, there could easily be multi-thousands of dollars spent. All of us living in Cape Elizabeth, brackets, 40 years for us, closed brackets, know the value of our schools, and we see less and less money available for them, and more and more courses being eliminated. So why should you authorize another unnecessary expense and we have better choices available. Respectfully yours, Richard Geyer. I would ask you to thank you for this. Thank you. Process. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stuart Wooden. I live at 33 Pilot Point Road and I'm a proponent of the yeah. Sorry, I've got a problem tonight, uh, but I'll do my best. My name is Stuart Wooden. I live at 33 Pilot Point Road in Cape Elizabeth, and I'm a proponent of the town vacating the paper street at Surfside Ave. Uh, since my background has been in accounting and finance, I'm a CPA, I was interested in calculating how the town's tax revenue would increase or decrease in the event the legal status of the Surfside Paper Street changed. That, this is what I learned. If the Surfside Paper Street remained extended, there would be no change in tax revenue to the town. That's obvious, it would remain status quo. If the Surfside Paper Street were accepted by the town, the tax revenue would likely decrease relative to, to the decline in property value of the Surfside Ave Avenue of the Butters, who would have a public trail running behind and very close to their homes. I did not attempt to calculate this as I'm not an appraiser, but it is intuitive that if property values go down, as they very likely will, taxes will go down with them. However, I did estimate the additional tax revenue the town would receive if the Surfside Paper Street is vacated. I developed the estimate I contacted the master, uh, the tax assessor at the time, and developed a calculation methodology and estimated the tax revenues to the town were reasonable. The additional revenue to the town from vacating the Surfside Paper Street would be if Surfside is vacated, the abutters would lose their 10% market discount on their taxes, giving more taxes to the town in the future. The Surfside abutters would then value the paper street that the town vacates again immediately in the future. These are the numbers I came up with with Matt's help. Yearly, the annual addition of additional tax revenue to the town approximate $34,500. Over 10 years, this additional tax revenue was estimated to amount to $334,000. And over 30 years, the additional tax revenue to the town would amount to over $100. If you look back four years when this paper street issue resurfaced, the town has already lost approximately $132,400 in tax revenue by not vacating Surfside in 2013. 
alone, these tax losses would make the extension of, uh, excuse me, extension or acceptance of this paper street a very expensive proposition for a short trail in a quiet neighborhood that is well served with ocean views from both the existing Surfside Gravel Road and the Land Conservancy's Trinity Point and Beach, the latter of which, as Jeff said, is open to the public. Mr. Wooden, can you conclude your comments? Uh, I have two sentences. I would ask that the town's tax assessor do his own calculation to inform the tax to the town council of this potentially lost tax revenue for consideration in the decision making making. I think these are very important cost components. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are councillors comfortable with continuing with public comment for the six people that we have remaining? Yes. Yes. Are there hold on please? Uh, are these the last six people that intend to speak on this issue? Thank you. Hi, I'm Melda Khalidi. I live at 19 Pilot Point Road, and I will be very short and sweet. Um, so far, I agree with all the speakers before me and what they have said, and I especially hearken to Jeff, Jeff Alexander's point of how just hateful and vitriolic the whole Short Acres neighborhood has become. It's just, it's, it's very disturbing. Um, especially in a time today in a divided America. Um, it just it astounds me that it, it reaches deep into our own neighborhoods. Um, on Pilot Point Road, which I drive every day, there are 18 children under the age of 10. They play in those streets. They're out there all the time. And for me, more car traffic would just be ridiculous and absolutely unwarranted and unsafe. And I know you folks don't sit in Washington, but you are our elected officials. And we are now going into, I believe, year five of this issue. So I ask that you take immediate action, vacate. I think that's something everybody can agree on, and let us all just move forward from this issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, I'm Heather Geike. I live at 12 Surfside Avenue. I'll try to use my singing voice so everybody can hear me. Um, and I've put my last song, so I'm getting old. Anyway, um, on page 16 of the 2013 Greenbelt Plan, it states, and I quote, where public rights boundaries are not clear, the Conservation Committee will have boundaries confirmed by a standard boundary survey. This has not been done by the firm hired by the town, Sebago Technics. Their survey stops in front of lot 62 on the gravel portion of Surfside Avenue. And it's on the U12 map that um, Andrea Adams handed out earlier. This map does make note of that area, and it appears that three fourths of the area involved in this discussion on the gravel portion of Surfside was either eliminated or overlooked in the Sebago Technic survey. Thank you. Thank you. And I also, I just want to thank everybody for their time. I know this has been ongoing and long and arduous, but we really appreciate the time and effort that you're putting into making this difficult decision. Um, I am in favor of vacating Surfside Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ann Ingalls. I live at 9 Wombeck Road. Uh, my husband, Andrew, and I have lived there for 26 years. It's been a long time. Um, Shore Acres residents and brought up three now teenage children there and uh, made use of all of the amenities that Shore Acres had to offer and they were robust. Um, I, I don't believe that I ever were, walked in front of the six houses in, that are in question um, that seem to be you know, in controversy on the um, path. And um, I'm in favor of vacating the paper street. Um, I think Jeff Alexander made some wonderful points, and uh, many of which I had written down myself. Um, I mean, it has really um, turned our neighborhood into a different place than it was when we first first moved there. You know, I I have some questions about the the. Um, report that came back, one of the charges was to talk about um, all of the practical considerations and determine a, to determine a complete cost-benefit analysis. And while 
it is feasible to build and you know all the wherefores there are are illuminated. I, I don't feel like um, the conservation commission um, really addressed much more than what they had already said around some of the other considerations. Um, you know the um, six um, point five, um, five or six points that are um, to be you know that they say are supported by um, this area underserved neighborhood, Jeff talked about that. Um, we have more than most neighborhoods connectivity. Um, we have lots of um, water body access um, already in our neighborhood. And um, and and there's um, one other thing, long distance walks. I mean, we're talking about 2,000 feet. I mean, it's, it's really not a large, um, walkway that um, is going to be there and available um, for recreating. Um, I just think we need to be realistic about what the likelihood of a you know future green belt path is going to be. Um, you know <clears throat> why does this stay on the recommended list? I have real concerns about that. And um, you know the other point was around, you know, whether or not we really know whether the neighborhood is supportive of this. Thank you. And thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trendy Road. Uh, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but <clears throat> I realized that uh, the folks who have, speak, have spoken so far, except two, uh, have direct personal interest in this issue because they live on uh, and about the Surfside Paper Street. Um, so I think in your consideration of any of these comments, you need to take into consideration the um, extraordinary interest, and I don't blame them um, for that. Um, but I think that what really is at stake here is um, something they already knew when they bought the property. They knew when they bought the, these properties that they abutted a paper street. They knew that. They knew that there are people who have deeded rights to this paper street, such as myself and other people in the neighborhood. They knew that the town have incipient rights of dedication, rights to the street that, that is for the public good. They knew this before they bought their properties. And they knew that Cape Elizabeth was developing a Greenbelt plan. All this was information that they had at the time, but when this consideration came up, maybe they thought it wouldn't affect them. I don't know. But um, obviously it has, and we're at this point today. Um, this is not a Shore Acres issue. The residents in Shore Acres uh, are clearly in favor of keeping their incipient rights of dedication and uh, other deeded rights to Surfside Avenue. Um, and if you need us to do a poll, we certainly will, and we have done that. In the last round of our petition, we had over 400 people sign it. If you need a copy of that, we can certainly provide it to you. We've provided it at least two or three times. We will do it again if we need to. This, this, it's, it's not an issue of, oh, half the, half the neighborhood wants this or not. It's, that is not the case. Uh, and we will show that to you if needed. Uh, it, the, the issues of tax, 
Mr. Wooden uh, and those living or but Surfside have never been taxed on the property. They have, gotten, they have received a tax break, in fact. And to now bring that up is a little bit of a concern to me. It's a little bit disingenuous. But I understand, and uh, I hope that you understand that this is a town-wide right it's an asset that you should keep for the town benefit. And if you need any help in understanding the popularity of this, we will certainly help you in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. Um, we've lived there for about 20 years. We've used both the gravel portion of Surfside Avenue and the portion that um, parallels Pilot Point Road. Um, this is a town asset. As Sheila had mentioned, the properties that abut this paper street get a discount. I believe it's a 5% discount on the property tax portion the land value, specifically because they abut the paper street. So it's not a secret. Um, this is not just a narrow strip, and it's not a short strip. It's over a quarter of a mile long, and it's along the ocean. It's a shoreline path. It's like a gem of an opportunity that doesn't present itself very often. Having a paper street with town incipient rights of dedication on that paper street abutting the shoreline, I would challenge that that doesn't happen often in a subdivision. The developer of our subdivision was smart, and he made sure that access to the waterfront wouldn't be given to an exclusive few. And that's what makes Shore Acres so special. But it also makes Cape Elizabeth special, because all Cape citizens who have been ta paying taxes for all these years have been subsidizing this town asset, and they have a right to enjoy it. Um, the mention of the ownership of the gravel portion, there was a confirmatory deed that occurred to confirm the rights to all of the lot owners in Shore Acres, um, with 71 of them signed up, and actually Stuart Wooden spearheaded that as president of SAIA at the time. He's well aware of it, but he lived at 35 Trendy Point at that time. Now he butts Surfside living off of Pilot Point, so there's a different point of view. Uh, he's changed. Um, but the the status of Surfside is not, the status of Atlantic Place is not, and the courts have provided a decision, not because the neighbors of, that want the Paper Street to become a green belt did anything other than to have to defend their rights because two of the property owners claimed that the town had vacated. All of the folks that want you to vacate want you to vacate so they can take that kind of action again against the neighborhood, hurting the community in our neighborhood, and I, I would say hurting Cape Elizabeth as a whole. The town has preserved this. We have a letter from the town in 2000 and, uh, what is it, 2011, 2012, supporting from the town council. We'll never give up our rights. It was from Jim Walsh. The 2013 Greenbelt plan and public process was done, and all of this was said then. Nothing's changed except for now you know by the Maine Superior Court that you're, the town's incipient rights of dedication are alive and well, and it, this should be enjoyed by all people as a big Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. And I would like the town to maintain their interests on Surfside Avenue and eventually develop the Greenbelt Trail on that portion. I don't think we should uh, keep it to just the folks that, those of us that live in the neighborhood and have uh, deeded wow. rights to it. Could you speak up a little bit, please? Sure. I don't think we should keep the trail just for the people that live in the neighborhood and have 
deeded rights and access to it. I think it should be enjoyed by everybody and anybody in the community who wants to use it. Um, it is a beautiful and valuable town asset, and I think, and I want you to maintain the rights to it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Chuck Rizuko. I live at 6 Wombat Road in Shore Acres. Um, one interesting thing I, as, a, as an observation is uh, we all have our own realities and we all create and live in our own realities and for the most part most realities can coexist. Whether, um, the, but the, what, one of the problems with the reality is, is that it come to be very myopic in scope, whether it be financial, whether it be safety, whether it be too many people coming into the neighborhood. But I think in, in lis listening to what's been said before me, am I the last one? Almost. Um, I kind of brings back to Charlie Brown uh, animations where the teacher is sitting there talking to the students going wah, 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 wah. And I, I can only imagine that's what it feels like sitting in your chairs. Um, and, and what I haven't heard and continue don't to hear is the issue of quality of life. The, the, the spirituality, and God knows I'm not a religious person, but there is something spiritual about being close to the ocean, being able to go down and sit on a rock and just watch the surf undulate in and out. And I, and I guess my concern is who's protecting the quality of life issues for the town of Cape Elizabeth residents. And in my opinion, I think the, the conservation committee is probably the greatest asset we have in protecting this quality of life in terms of being connected spiritually and physically with our environment. And I fully support the efforts and the work that this, this committee has done, the yeoman's work that they've been doing for the past years. And I support their recommendations in the report, and I would hope you, the town council, also would do the same. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. First, I'm Jay Chatmus. My wife and I own 15 Pilot Point Road. Uh, I first moved to Shore Acres. We first moved to Shore Acres in 1997, so I have a quite a familiar, familiarity with the neighborhood. I'd like to, I have been asked to read a, first thing, a message from Joe and Marilyn Britta, who live at 12 of Algonquin Road in Shore Acres. It's two streets away from Pilot Point Road. They asked me to read the following email. Note that they, they were unable to attend the meeting tonight, so I'm reading this on their behalf. Joe and Marilyn Britta, 12 Algonquin would like you to know that we are not in favor of any walking path construction on Pilot Point Paper Road. The concept of building and paying and maintaining this path defies the boundary of common sense. Yes, there may be a deeded right of way for us to use this property, but in reality, it has almost never been used in many, many decades. We hope you will take these remarks seriously in your consideration. Thank you, Joe and Marilyn Britta. Uh, I'd like to follow up and respond to a couple of comments that were made earlier, uh, one of which was that the property owners who purchased lots on Pilot Point Road knew there was a paper street there. Yes, we did. We knew there was a paper street there. Uh, I, before we purchased on Pilot Point Road, I actually met with the town manager and discussed the situation. And he said, and I'm going to try to paraphrase this as accurately as I can. He said that, yes, there's a paper street there. In all likelihood, it will probably never be developed in any way or fashion. Just what he said. Uh, he said, you may mow it, you may plant on it, you may enjoy it as your backyard but we cannot guarantee the future but we cannot envision that it would ever be developed any further uh, another thing i'd like to point out and this is real important it's a technicality every road on the subdivision plan in, in shore acres is 50 feet wide all easements for all public ways in almost every town in america 
has a right of way of 50 feet uh, to allow for 20, 22 feet of travel way and then gutters on each side for snow removal and parking and so forth. Atlantic Place and every road indeed in Shore Acres is 50 feet wide, including the Surfside Paper Street. However, Atlantic Place is the one exception. It is 20 feet wide. There is no, in general, I'm not going to make a blanket statement, but there is no town planner that would ever plan a public way, a public road, a public avenue at 20 feet in width. You, how could you have two cars passing, room for snow removal, and so forth? Time is concluded. Can you wrap up your comments? Yes. Thank you. Two, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Atlantic Place is 20 feet wide. It is currently being used as two private driveways, uh, 19 Pilot Point Road and 4 Atlantic Place. Soon it will be used as a third private driveway. Uh, there are at least five cars currently using that as their private driveway. Uh, uh, this is the only access to that end, to the southwest end of Surfside Avenue, is Atlantic Place. So that, it, in the proposed plan, a 20-foot wide private driveway will be used with pedestrians and vehicles. I think you can see the potential uh, problems that that would create. It's a private driveway. Last thing is, the other statement that was made, thank you, uh, was that this Surfside was designed as a walking trail. Be aware that the developer's plans, if you look at those, you may be aware of this, each lot on Pilot Point Road is two lots. The lower Surfside Avenue was clearly designed as a 50-foot wide right-of-way and a public way to access the lower lots that were originally designed into the developer's plan sometime over the years, those two lights were com lots were combined. So it was not designed as a walking way. It was designed as a avenue for vehicles to access their lower lot. Thank you, town councilors, for your time. Thank you very much. Um, the recommendation uh, in the agenda is to acknowledge receipt of the technical assessment regarding these paper streets. Councilor Jordan. I'd like to move that we thank the Conservation Committee and acknowledge receipt of the paper street technical assessment report and that we also begin the necessary steps to vacate the following streets ID'd as U125 Surfside Avenue, U128 Atlantic Place, U151 Lighthouse Point Road, pursuant to 23 MRS Section 3027, which may include the provision of proper notice to the planning board, as well as all lot owners on applicable recorded subdivision plans and their mortgagees of record. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Councilor Jordan? Discussion? Councilor Sullivan? Yeah, I just, I've got a rules question that's not on the agenda. It's not uh, an agenda item. It was not in the town council packet. It's not a motion before us in our agenda. So while I recognize Councilor Jordan's uh, right to amend something or bring it up, I'm just, I've got a, a procedure and a rules question on this. Um, and I also have uh, uh, other questions about this as well. You want to stick to the rules question first? Yes, please. Okay. I was Councilor Jordan? Put my input on the rules question. We often accept reports and then decide what we're going to do with them. Go to a next meeting, set a public hearing, go to a workshop. This is exactly the exact similar situation. Accepting the report and asking that we move along to the next step. That next step is to begin the process. I think Matt wants to weigh in. Yep. Go ahead. Just as a, uh, a point of clarification, I did reach out to the uh, the attorney based on uh, Council Jordan's request as to what possible actions the council would be able to take as a result of uh, on with this as an agenda item. 
the motion is not to vacate the streets, but it's to start the process. So uh, he felt that we were within, uh, or the council would be within their rights in order to take a subsequent action, but it would be to start the process, not to, so it would be setting the agenda item for a, a date in the future, uh, because it is specific that to, to do that has enough weight to it to actually do the vacation process. So this would be to accept it, but then state, okay, now, letting the public and the world to, to see the council's intent from this, based on this motion, is to at a future date uh, to begin that process. So they can, they can run on parallel tracks, but it's important that, because uh, the process of vacation is, itself is all spelled out in statute under certain certain steps that one needs to take. It's a much longer process than just one, one evening meeting. So. Uh, so it, it is in it is in line with being a proper proper motion, but uh, if the, it is a subsequent act that that does have to take place and begin that process. So it's kind of a, it's almost like a two part two part motion to, to, to go in that direction. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, given that that this is apparently copacetic, uh, I'm still quite surprised at the intent of the council as we had voted to retain these streets and all of a sudden we are going, we're starting the process to vacate them. We haven't even as a council reviewed the report. So I, I would imagine our very first step <coughs> to be to set a workshop to review this report we've received that we paid quite a lot of money for uh, in October. And I, I just don't see how we can take any step forward in any direction without doing that first. So I, I certainly am not supporting this motion as it stands. Thank you. Council Lennon? Uh, just on the point, the, the, the technical point, it just says the recommended action is to acknowledge receipt. That, that's not, that's just, sometimes the manager will put, here's what I recommend in order to streamline things. It doesn't in any way say we have to. But, um, the, man, I, I, the manager I, and I collaborate on development of the agenda. Yeah, that's so, sorry, that's what I mean. But I just it's not reflecting the manager's well. Sorry, <laughs> the council chair. Um, I, just to respond to Jessica's comment, which I think is is um, very well taken. But um, two points. In my opinion, this um, process well, this process has gone on <coughs> so long as someone pointed out, five years, um, that I do believe that we have discussed it and met about it. I mean, the number of meetings, I can't even begin to think. There, there are dozens and dozens between the Conservation Commission. The council, I think, had three workshops on paper streets. I believe we've had one workshop on this. We had a community-wide meeting in the fire station many years ago. Um, there's been many, there's been a public hearing and many sessions like this of the public talking before. So unlike most actions that I do believe or most items on the agenda that are relatively new, I feel that this is so far past its time for somebody to make a decision that the process itself has taken on a life that um, has gone awry, I think. And we owe everyone in this neighborhood, I believe, a decision. Um, and we could take it to workshop um, and take a few more months, but I, for one, don't feel the need to because, for me, the issue really never was the feasibility of putting in the path. I always knew you could put a path there. You can put a path anywhere if you want to badly enough. Um, so the report was so narrow in its scope that, for me, it's, it's not an important piece of my decision. For me, it's a much bigger and broader issue about an aggressive um, diminishment of individuals fundamental right to enjoy their property with some peace of mind about the present and the future. Um, and secondly, for, an, for a neighborhood to um, live with some tranquility and peace, and I believe that they were doing that before local government got involved, and it's just a shame, I think, that it ever did. I never understood why this wasn't taken off the list when the other paths that were right across people's public property like the Sprigs and the Jordans, it was stripped off right after that meeting where they pointed out why this one stayed, I don't know. I do know it was done by a vote in August of the Conservation Commission with only five members there and it was a three to two vote. So not a ringing endorsement. I won't go on and on. I would just like to point out that um, 
in my view, it doesn't pass the straight face test. I think any of us sitting here who had this path proposal going this closely in through our backyards, five, ten feet from our house, would be standing up there asking the council to please vacate it. I'm not in favor of extending or accepting because, again, I feel that horse has left the barn. Five years ago, four years ago, maybe three, but this has become so contentious and so protracted that I think now the only choice in front of us is to vacate. And just one final point, I'd like to put it in a little bit of historic perspective. Um, for the eight years I've been on the council, every topic that has to do with something like this, aka preserving the fundamental integrity of a neighborhood without too much traffic, uh, too much monkeying with basic rights for people to enjoy each other and enjoy their houses. We've always voted in favor of the integrity of, of neighborhood and people's basic right to their property. And I'll just give you a few examples I thought of on my way over here. Um, Short-term rentals, we debated that for a year. We finally found very much in favor of the neighborhoods. Bed and breakfasts, we regulated that so no, no one opened one. Um, windmills, we talked about that for a year. And the noise, we realized, became um, a potential problem. Noise ordinances in general uh, favor the private property owner. The multiplex unit proposal on the three acres in neighborhoods we shot down, again, because people were nervous that it would violate the small, close-knit sense of their community. Um, Off-road parking at night, and on and on and on. This council has a history of ensuring people's ability to live well and peacefully in their houses, which is usually their greatest investment they've made. So I feel that vacating this falls in line with this. I think it's way past time, and I think we owe it not only to the abutters, but just as much so to everyone else in this neighborhood so they can get back together, make friends again, and carve out a way to let any neighbor who wants to walk across this land do it anytime they want. That's my feeling. Further discussion? Councilor Brennan? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Jamie. So, while it's a very good point as far as process, Jessica, and I can appreciate um, wanting to go through a process, proper process, I am um, not in favor of going to a workshop or doing that. I think the report's actually very easy to understand. In fact, they said, you know, building this path was very, very simple. Um, and I think their outcomes and their report was very easy to digest and understand. So I'm not even sure even if we were in favor of a path, potentially, that we would need to go to a workshop on it. Um, that's one. The second thing is that the attorney has said that we can move forward um, to vacate. Um, so I would be in favor of if that is the next step of setting a public hearing uh, next month. Um, it sounds like that's what this motion will be uh, moving us into motion. Um, as for comments on um, what I've heard over um, my, I think it's, maybe it's been the last couple of years we've been touching on this, and specifically the last year with Paper Streets, um, I do feel like Andrea Adams' information um, was really enlightening and, um, and interesting in, in the fact that they they have deeded ownership of part of this path. Um, I think that we can't ignore that, and I feel that that's, that was pretty powerful stuff to come forward, one. Two, I, one of the speakers who spoke last who um, talked about in 1911 when the developer built this road, um, it is my belief that he built that road to make it a road to access those front lots. In 1911, as much as I would love to believe that people are visionary to have open space and things, that was not happening. Um, it just wasn't. I mean, in the 70s when I moved here, they were still dumping sewage from people's cove into the water. So nobody was talking open space. Um, that dialogue has changed. And I understand this debate. Um, so I, and I think it's an important one. So I don't believe that was the intent. I think when the two roads, the two lots came together, that the need for the road was no longer there and was not necessary. And um, it, it never was intended, as I said, as a path. Um, I do believe that that path has not been well traveled. I, I actually spent time pushing through the pricker bushes over there and hanging off the cliffs trying to figure it out. Um, I do find it interesting, um, the two conflicting reports, you know, as far as cost on this from um, the Jim Fisher report that we saw come through from the, the, the people from the neighborhood would like to not see the path, uh, the cost of a well-constructed um, 
uh, PAP would be in the, in the range of forty to $60,000 versus the Con Conservation Commission. And through their lens, they're looking to want something to go through and be very, very easy. And the last thing I guess I would say, um, or two things, is um, I do believe in stealing the, the line from a movie that um, if you build it, what was it, build a dream, they will come. I do think that the neighborhood's concerns of safety and cars coming and people, if, the, the, if we were to put a path in, um, that it would forever change um, this neighborhood. Um, and unfortunately, I think that this debate has forever changed this neighborhood, but I'm confident that if we take this off the table, that in time, um, having been somebody who went through um, a lot of tension in my neighborhood through short-term rentals, that this neighborhood will uh, once again be as it was. My mom lived there, and there used to be a lot of great um, camaraderie and all kinds of things, and I know that has been really, really hard. So I am in favor of uh, not leaving this in limbo, leaving this neighborhood in flux, um, leaving this controversy on the table. Um, I voted to vacate, or wanted to vote to vacate it. Um, I voted against retaining it because I really think it's not something that the, that the people who are on the ocean are the most affected by this. They have, they're giving up everything and getting really nothing. And I'm off ocean, I run through you know the existing gravel path, all of us, are giving up nothing and getting everything, and it's not necessary. The last point I'll say, I know I was supposed to make last first, was that I do agree that this, this neighborhood is not underserved. They have a sandy beach, and um, again, it used to be a walk from my mom's house, and all that open space. Um, so I am in favor of putting this to bed, and um, putting on the agenda, and uh, vacating um, you know, all of these properties um, on Surfside Atlantic, and I, is this including two lights? Yeah. White House point. Lighthouse, uh, yeah. For the same reasons, Julie. Well, I'm I'm really quite perplexed. Um, I thought we settled this on October 5th last year when we voted to retain as a council. So I I'm left to wonder what kind of meetings and and discussions have been taking place that I'm completely unaware of. Because I this is a this is an absolute shock to me. I mean, we, we've gotten a report that we asked for, that we paid for, and now there's a movement to vacate. The Conservation Commission has no intention of building a trail right now. Nothing is ta being taken away from the, the people on Pilot Point Road, and I really would like to know what, where this came from, because frankly, I, I thought it was settled in October. We voted in favor of retaining the rights. 20 years. Huh? And so I just don't understand where this is coming from, and I'd like some answers. Okay. Councilor Jordan? I can answer that to the best of my ability, anyhow. I remember when we voted to extend, I specifically, and I'm, I'm not going to say 100% on my memory, but I'm quite sure I asked Maureen if we voted to extend that we could vote to vacate at any point in the future, and she said yes. And then Jamie wanted to have this feasibility report done. So the only way to really move this train along was to extend the rights, because they were going to expire, and get this feasibility report, knowing from asking the question that a vacation could come later at any point. So it's no surprise the information was gathered at the same meeting when we extended the rights. Councilor Wright? Um, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, it's interesting because when Jessica just mentioned that, I was thinking the same thing. Like, uh, I've missed something. Um, well, n I'm not saying with the, the group. I'm saying that it was on our agenda to um, acknowledge receipt of the Paper Street Technical Assessment. So we just received it, and I thought, hmm, okay, then we'll probably go to, ca we'll probably go to workshop and have an additional discussion. So when Caitlin made her motion, which she clearly had prepared in advance, and any counselor can make a motion, um, I was actually surprised that um, Caitlin would do that because Caitlin has been one of the proponents that uh, when we receive information, we should go to workshop, we should have a public hearing, and then we should vote. Um, but it seems to be a little of both depending on what the issue is. Um, I am not going to support that motion bigger there. Um, I think that the recommendation of the Conservation Committee is important. 
I think delving more into the report from Sebago Technics is important. Um, I've said things before, but I'm going to repeat them. Um, I walked this property a couple years ago. And for those people who think that the neighbors are going to be friendly and nice and wonderful, um, I was not treated as such. I was yelled at to get off a property. I was on the paper street. When the person found out I was a counselor, the tone changed. It's not going to be, the people are not going to be allowed to walk that. So if you think that's going to happen, it's not. Um, I do recognize that many of the speakers have personal interests in this property. They abut it. Um, it, is, it is the property that they use or have used or have put items in. Um, and I think it's terribly sad that the community, that neighborhood, has allowed this to pull, pull, pull themselves apart. Um, I could say more about that, but I'm not going to. I think that people could be a little, um, uh, you know, tougher and a little bit more um, caring about their neighbors. I had a meeting on Saturday. <laughs> it was something very similar. Um, I have a path next to my house. It's a land trust path. It goes nowhere. It's a circle. It's not connective, so I don't see that being connective is anything that's terribly important. It does concern me um, that people are saying, well, we don't want anybody from out of state in our, in our neighborhood. We don't want out of state plates. We're, children are going to be hit by cars. Um, that smacks to me a little bit of the not in my backyard. And this property this property belongs, to, this paper street belongs to the town. I feel it's the council's obligation to look out after the town, not looking out after individual property owners who have an interest, and I don't blame them, they have an interest. I mean, I get that. Um, I think that the council has to be aware that our job is to protect the town assets, not to protect assets of individual people, family, or friends. Um, I've said that before. Um, I, I, I still feel fairly strongly that that's somewhat what, which is going on. Um, I was not prepared for this tonight. And, and I, again, I'll say that I share Jessica's um, position that it appears that there has been discussion behind the scenes by some people because some counselors were prepared for tonight. Um, and I, that may just be a feeling. Um, it may not be true, but I usually don't get sideswiped pretty quickly like that. But that's okay because I can pretty quickly say what I think. So I will be voting against this motion. I think that the town should maintain the two properties that the Conservation Commission has suggested. Um, I don't think they suggested it um, because they didn't think that the town um, shouldn't, I mean, they, they suggested because they think the town should maintain these properties and keep them. Um, these properties are potentially for the use of everyone, not just the neighborhood, not just the people who abut the property. Um, I think that we should, I try to be fair to everybody. <clears throat> there are people all over the place. This is not a everybody wants this. This is a way on two sides of the of the issue. And we have heard about it for a long time. I think that, um, I'd like to have it resolved, but I think that we owe it to the town and the townspeople to do everything and cross all the T's and dot all the I's before we rush into a decision. So um, I wouldn't support this motion anyway, but I'm not going to support it because I also think it was somehow rushed into this evening's meeting. Um, so. I will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Yeah, I've got a couple other questions. Um, if the council votes to vacate, which I am hoping they do not, uh, and in response to council comments about property and neighborhoods and individual people, I think that there may be another problem, and that there are apparently quite a few people in Shore Acres who have needed rights
to the paper streets. If we vacate those paper, uh, paper streets, what happens to their deeded rights to those paper streets? Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is something that needs to be addressed by Mr. Parkinson. I think that um, we've had, we had a wonderful uh, engineering report, and, uh, but we've had some people that came up and disputed it. And so I, you know, I recognize their right to do so, but I'm not willing to accept their comments without a little more in-depth review, bringing in the engineer with the concerns that were voiced here tonight. I mean, we need more information. You know, we can't summarily dispute something without, without giving everybody who was involved in that study a chance to look at it. But I really, I have another concern about, as I mentioned, about um, uh, the deeds. Now, the other thing is, is that, you know, on October 5th, at that point, we had had, and I think this was pointed out at the town meeting, at that point, 19 meetings of various types on this issue, which points to just how very serious it is. And uh, I think that one of the most important series of meetings that were held were neighborhood meetings. I'm not sure all the counselors here tonight attended any of those meetings or all of them. I did. I attended some. But the, the support for retaining the streets was overwhelming. And I would also point out that the Shore Acres Association is the majority group in the Shore Acres area. They seem to have more members. We heard it was overwhelming response in favor of retaining than far more than emails in favor of vacating. So I'd like to remind council of that. But beyond that, back to the legal question and the point I'd like to just reiterate of uh, complaints about the study, we don't have an opportunity to address those. And we haven't given the engineer an opportunity to address those. So, you know, I don't know how we can do anything else tonight except it, rather than accept the report and then, and then go to a workshop and get some more answers. I just like to point out that we're, we're, we're not closing the door tonight. We're not able to even if we wanted to. We're beginning another lengthy process. And all we're doing is beginning it in a certain way. We still have to have, a, I think, a public hearing in August and another council meeting to debate it, at which point we can, between now and then, we can ask for all the information we want on all these good questions that you're asking. What happens to the deeded people? What about the technical issues? Why was there so much discrepancy between the two reports? If people still care about the feasibility, even though the Conservation Commission is not recommending putting in a um, And secondly, we can take concurrent tracks. If we feel strongly that we want to discuss this in a workshop, we could put it on our uh, September 5th workshop and be discussing it while, while the, the motion or the, the movement toward vacating it is going along it, because it's going to take a while. So in other words, we don't preclude any of the things you're asking for. Well then, why bother to include language to vacate? Because Leaving I, the amendment, the, 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 the item the way it is, doesn't preclude that. But I really object to adding that language because it implies an assumption as to the direction of the council. And so why not just leave the item the way it is? We accept it and then we move forward. Council Grant? I was say that to me, um, when we're going through, for example, the budget process, we had a motion to accept the budget from school board. And you, in charge of finance, came in and made a, an amendment for a changing motion on the floor immediately to, <clears throat> to change, get rid of it by 1%. So I think of that, again, going back to what the attorney said, that we can make any motion at any time and put this on the agenda. Certainly the council, it takes four votes, can vote against it. So, I, and I think there's ample time for discussion in the whole thing. As for um, our discussing this ahead of time, we didn't. This has been my plan personally, since Jamie left the door open and put this feasibility study as part of it, the re retaining, and when I saw Caitlin made it, Put, contacted um, you know, the manager about this, and I was like, great, I don't need to have a conversation. We'll be, ha we'll be having that. So that was my clue. Uh, it was last Friday when this came through, and when I saw and I was copied on the email. We are not allowed to talk about things ahead of time, and I'm just stating for the record that we did not. So um, 
Anyway, I, I hope that um, I understand your concern. It's, it's not what you wanted, but I, I, I do. I still think it's the right way to proceed, and I think we got it cleared, and I think we can. So I, I guess I'd like to vote on this motion. Councilor, I said a couple of points. Two, I am sorry that I don't have enough time to read the agenda sooner, but as soon as I got to it and wanted to move this forward, I contacted Matt and the attorney so that I'd have proper language made up ahead of time so that you could have it and look at it. Um, we're not voting to vacate tonight. We're voting to start the process. You, you keep alluding to that we're done. We just need to start the lengthy process that the attorney sent to us that's spelled out in the statute because clearly we can't just vote to vacate tonight. It takes time. We have to give notice. We have to have hearings. We have to talk about it. And then your last question about the deeded rights. We have had five years of conversations with our attorneys, and we know that when we vacate, the, the deeded rights to the people that have it written in their deed do not go away. The easement does not go away. They continue to get to have the easement across that property. The only thing that's going away is the ability for the town to do anything with that property. And the other people in the neighborhood that have the property have said that they will give deeded rights to the other people in the neighborhood that don't have it included in theirs. But that's for them to figure out with their attorneys and they can have fun doing that. But nothing happens to the rights that are already in somebody's deed. We cannot affect somebody else's deeded rights. Anything we do cannot change that. And our attorney has told us that several times in the 19 meetings that we've had over the last five years. Um, I'm going to jump in. I was not expecting this to be the way this went tonight. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, I expected, as we do so often with so many um, instances like this, that um, we would receive the report from the committee that was asked to do it. Um, we would go to a workshop, have an opportunity to question some of the findings, um, of which I have a number of questions. Uh, some have been raised here tonight. Um, as somebody who, prior to being on the council, served on a couple of committees which prepared reports, um, I, you know, I know that if I was on the conservation committee and this was the action that the council took tonight, I would personally perceive it as a slap in the face for the work that was done. Um, that all being said, I, I, I you know, I, I do have, like I said, a lot of questions about some of the information that was in the report. I just don't feel like we're across the finish line on this process. I appreciate everybody's feeling that this has been talked to death. You know, I, I honestly wasn't expecting all the um, even public comment here tonight because I, I truly thought that this was going to be more of a procedural matter of referring it to a workshop and not a decisioning uh, vote of any kind. Um, I find it ironic that there's an agenda item coming up in a few minutes, hopefully, that is uh, a lot of question being asked around, are we moving too fast on something, or are we rushing a decision? And yet, here we are on a different matter saying, let's push ahead and jam this through. So um, it concerns me that we, you know, would have asked the committee to do work, had an expert consult on it, and not have the chance to fully um, review, respond to, ask questions, uh, etc., um, of, of, of that finding, um, simply just to get things to the finish line. If ultimately, through that process, people's minds are not changed, I fully respect that and, frankly, anticipate that to be the case, but I think it would be a disservice um, and a bad precedent to, uh, to simply leap to that conclusion at this point. So that's my feeling on the matter. Are there other comments or discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question. Can you repeat the motion, please, Deb? Yes, it's to thank the Conservation Committee and to take necessary steps to begin vacating the proposed U-12-5 Surfside Avenue, U-12-8 Atlantic Place, U-15-1 Lighthouse Point Road, pursuant to 23 MRS, subsection 3027 which may include prop, uh, excuse me, provision of proper notice to the planning board as well as to all lot owners on applicable recorded subdivision plans and their mortgages of record. Thank you. That's the motion on the table. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion passes.
Next item on the agenda is number 101-2017, 19 Wells Road, Tower Overlay District Zoning Map Amendment. Councilor Jordan. Um, I'll recuse myself because... Hold on, hold on. If people are planning to leave, could you do so quickly and quietly? We'll wait a minute. Back to number 101-2017, Councilor Jordan. Yes, I'll recuse myself as one of the owners of the property. Council, uh, all in favor of Councilor Jordan recusing yourself on this issue? I, I, I move to accept Councilor uh, Jordan's uh, self-recusal. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Second, Councilor Caitlin Jordan. All those in favor? Great. Uh, I just have to disclose that I'm close, close personal friend and six times removed related <laughs> to the Jordan family involved in this. Do counselors have any objection to Caitlin participating in this item? We're seeing a conflict. Thank you. Thank you for disclosing that. Um, Do you want to introduce us or have Joe? Sure. Uh, this evening, uh, Joe Shalat is here from the planning board to help uh, tee this up, I believe, as well. Uh, if, if you'd like to come forward, and just uh, we have a planning board recommendation that was unanimous to, to move forward with this uh, overly request. And uh, Mr. Shalat's here to, to tee it up, I guess. Thank you. Put it. Thank you. Um, so this matter uh, was uh, sent to the planning board to uh, recommend or not recommend whether the uh, tower overlay district um, be placed here. And the planning board uh, decided to uh, principally uh, with the three ideas. One, um, there's an existing overlay district adjacent to it. If you look at the map in back of you, it's basically to the right, and I think it's a little bigger than the one that's there. Um, it does not breach the 250-foot uh, RPI buffer that is uh, in the area, and no new road would need to be built to access it. Um, I just remind everybody that granting an overlay district is only the first step in uh, placing a cell tower there. Uh, we just sought to answer very basic questions about the suitability of the site and not get into any of the uh, more technical issues that would be addressed on a site plan for a tower in that spot. Any questions? Any questions from counselors? Okay. Any additional comment? To be rendered, or mm -hmm. is there additional comment? We do have uh, also uh, Victor Manugian and uh, Paul Pickens are both here representing Crown Castle this evening. To uh, I know this is uh, the second time that the council has uh, come forward on this, and uh, we'd like to just come forward and briefly describe the, the project again to refresh uh, council's memory. That would be helpful. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, Mr. Manager. For the record, Victor Manugian from McLean Middleton on behalf of Global Signal Acquisitions for LLC. Castle. 
Um, as you stated, Paul Peckins is behind me. He's from Crown Castle. He's going to speak briefly. I'm going to speak much briefer. Um, we also have Steve Kennedy, the RF engineer, um, if there's any questions for him. And Stephanie Jordan, our wetlands uh, specialist, if the wetlands scientist, wetland scientist specialist, if there's any questions of her. And also James uh, Bonomi from um, Crown Castle as well. Um, uh, we've come through the process, we've gone through the planning board, we've uh, been here about six months now since I started the process with this council, and as the uh, report from the chairman from the planning board stated, um, um, they supported this, it was actually five to zero supporting it, and they um, are recommending um, uh, that this go back to the council with their support. Um, we will have to go back to the planning board, assuming this goes to the next step and that's uh, positive, we will have to go back to the planning board to do site plan review and address all the ground conditions and, the, and all their jurisdiction. Um, so I would ask that you support this and also send it over to the ordinance uh, um, committee review uh, for review and public hearing on August 14th. With that, I'll turn it over to Paul Peckins. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Paul Peckins. I'm with Crown Castle. I'm out of the Richmond, Virginia office. Um, I'd like to talk to you about why this site is so important. If you look at it, it covers 80,000 vehicles per day. It also covers approximately 1,000 households. It provides critical coverage for the residents, the local businesses, and the public safety agencies, as well as it's our objective to, pro to provide a viable alternative site to ensure that there's no loss in network coverage or gap in service. And then finally, to keep it quick, uh, this is how the old infrastructure looks today. This is how the new infrastructure would look as proposed. You can see the tower off to the left is a slimmer design. It's the monopole concept. And hopefully it adds a, a lower profile visual impact to the view shed. And then finally, we'd like to thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, staff has our contact information. We're happy to answer any questions that anybody has, as well as the experts that we brought in if there's any technical questions for them. Thank you very much. Councilor Jordan. Can you go back two slides to the coverage area? Is that, what is the, so you got the blue that goes out so far at the top and then down to the way it's not covered? How come we can't reach them? How come we can't reach them? What? I, you know, I'm going to turn that over to Steve, who is our RF engineer. He'll be able to give you a much better detail analysis than I would. It seems like it goes so far out to the right. Why can't we get just a little bit more to get to those neighborhoods? Take <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> My name's Steve Kennedy. I'm a radio frequency engineer. Uh, I'm a vendor at Crown Castle. I provide support and consulting services and RF engineering things. Uh, I work and help them create search rings for sites that when we run into this particular situation, we have to relocate. I give them guidance on where to start looking and how to review and look at things. Um, as far as the answer, why does it go farther to the east and not to the west? And Radio frequencies, when they hit water, they like to travel. Mm -hmm. Water, it's called path loss. So the simple way to look at it is a, a transmitter, a dipole is erected, and power goes through that dipole, that antenna, okay, and it propagates out. Well, what happens is if you go in the distance, power goes by the floor. Industrial area, is it suburban townhouses, houses, things of that nature? Those all impact that energy as it moves across the curvature of the space of the earth. Well, once the energy hits the water, all of those things that stop it or slow it down or cause it to decrease in coverage, uh, 
it goes away, and so it gets to go a little farther. Hence, the coverage yeah. off to the east farther than the coverage to the west. Now, um, the second part of that aspect is, depending on the height, how high that transmitter is, how high that transmitter is, is how far it will cover. Um, anybody have a Wi-Fi? Notice when you stick the Wi-Fi router access point, the more rooms you walk away from, the more cars you get away from, the last power has a little less slower it goes. It comes out, the access point goes out. Two milliseconds later, I'm going to email that, Dad, the internet's down, <laughs> fix it, right? So what happens is, as you go through walls, as you go through things, it becomes a, a lower signal. That's why the signal bar on your phone or your tablet or your laptop mm -hmm. goes down and down as you move away from it. Same thing happens here. The more far you move away from it, the faster the signal degrades. And that rule is path loss, double the distance, the power divides by four, or if you increase the frequency, you go double the frequency higher, it goes from 800 megahertz to 1600 megahertz, the power reduces. Okay, so that's propagation, that's path loss deep speed, okay? But it's basically far away from the transmitter, the less power I have to be able to hear it. It's like you're across the yard and you yell, and how well do they hear you? It's how well, how loud you yell, and how boisterous you are, right? Just like the umpire at the baseball game. So that's why less, more to the east and less to the west. The second part of that aspect is, um, this transmitter has a limited amount of bandwidth. Okay, it can only service so much. So you go to the cable company, you say, oh, I want a 12 megabits download, or I want a 50 megabits download, right? It's a lim there's a limitation of the energy that can be allocated to you. Same thing happens with the radio transmitter. The more users that get on the system, the lower the bandwidth each person has in that system. So I equate that to my 14-year-old daughter's streaming video, my 13-year-old son's playing Xbox Live, and I'm trying to do work and my wife is surfing the web. The more of us that attach, the less amount of bandwidth we have for each of us. So that's the second part of the aspect, is the sites, you don't want them to cover too far, because there's other neighboring sites that will cover those areas possibly better than that area. You run into places where you might have not as good a coverage in the house out on cell edge, or it might not be as fast, but the service is still being generated because these, these transmitters, in a way, will interfere with each other a little bit because they're, they're all noisemakers, right? You get three or four kids screaming, they're all noisemakers. Well, if you lower one, you see a little bit of a change in, in the dynamic of the room if you're in the kindergarten class, but not a lot. So they all kind of work together, and they all have to cover the areas they're supposed to cover, and try to maintain that so you can increase the amount of speed each user has. So you want that person driving back in towards Portland to move on to the next site so that site covers its assigned area. And the amount of bandwidth stays high enough for the areas where that site has to serve. That is your question? Yeah, mm -hmm. just, those neighborhoods have been asking for years and I just, this is the opportunity to ask why we can't get coverage and, and, it's, and it's a limitation of the frequency band that the carriers are allocated by the FCC and what you can do with those bands right. and how much power is allowed. So just to get on the record, putting this cell phone tower up, there's nothing additional that we could do, like build it 10 feet higher, but you know what I mean? Like that's going to achieve, I, I'm just envisioning questions coming yeah, up so in you know, six months. You know what um, I mean? If you think of it like... Um, an AM radio station, well, we don't listen to them a lot anymore, but we do. There's, there's AM radio stations, they're very tall, and they cover a very large area. And there's a limited number of listeners, users. These sites uh, cover this fixed area on what they can do, and what the carrier engineer's fun in life is, is trying to make sure that it's balanced and equal. We can build it 400 foot it's not really going to help because it's going to become such a noise generator that it's going to degrade what the neighboring towers do, that kindergarten situation. Yep. I just want to ask, is there anybody else from the public that wishes to speak on this issue? No? Okay. Any other questions for the um, folks here tonight? Seeing none. Uh, 
Is there anybody who'd like to make a motion? Sarah? I move we refer this amendment to the Ordinance Committee for review and set the request for a public hearing on Monday, August 14th, 2017, 7 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second that. Councilor Grennan, <coughs> any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate it. Next up on the agenda is item number 102-2017. Uh, we have a recommendation from the planning board on an amendment to the zoning ordinance in order to clarify an existing provision that agricultural land be preserved or may be preserved as part of open space and new development. Town planner Maureen O'Meara is here. Maureen, would you like to introduce this, please? I'm just trying to get the technology out of the Fact, Councilor Garvin, Planning Board Chair. And if you Jordan could just speak up as Planning Board Chair Jordan is here to oh. represent this. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Had, you had stepped aside for the other issue, I forgot. <laughs> sorry about that. Hi, I'm Carol Ann Jordan. I'm the chair of the Planning Board, and I'm here uh, to represent them in our request to um, put, a, put an amendment to the uh, zoning ordinances forward for review by the uh, ordinance committee and for potential public hearing uh, in August. And what this is, is we're looking to clarify agricultural easement um, and reducing the amount of property to be, for which the easement will cover and not requiring a five acre um, minimum. Uh, it would require still that a farm be at least far, five acres in order to make this request and that it would meet the specifications of the tax exemption, exemption rules set by the state for farms that have uh, applied to, be, to have a special tax um, privilege. Uh, a, ta a farm does not have to do that, um, many of them larger ones don't, um, but um, it would uh, allow a, a farm to reserve, to set an agricultural easement on a portion of the property. And so you have in your packet a, um, an overview prepared by the town planner as well as the proposed new language, and we're just asking that you move it forward to the ordinance committee for review and potential public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Have any questions? Uh, I'll um, open up to questions, but I also want to be sure that we allow um, uh, public comment on this. And in doing so, I want to also um, uh, make a personal apology for not having um, uh, extended public comment on this matter last month. Um, it was a complete oversight on my part. We did have a couple of folks um, from the development, representing the development, that were speaking and presenting, and I think relative to a couple of other items that were on the agenda last month and a large turnout that we had for people speaking on those, um, quite frankly, just kind of got lost in the process. So, so I certainly apologize for those that felt that they didn't have the chance to speak. Um, I know that we received emails from some of you on that, and um, your points were certainly heard through email. Um, in no way was that oversight intended to suppress any comment from the public, so I just apologize for that. And at this point, would welcome anybody who's interested in speaking on this to come up to the podium. Um, similar to earlier in the night, uh, about three minutes for your comments, please. And um, if you could just queue up if there's a line of folks. Thank you. State your name and your address or um, affiliation to this. My name is Priscilla Harrison. A good evening to everybody. And uh, I live at 29 Westminster Terrace. Uh, I, along with my husband, Peter Dixon, and, <laughs> and several others, um, have an open letter to present to you. And uh, the signers have all read it, and I'd like to 
read it quickly out loud for the benefit of the public. Uh, it says, open letter to Cape Elizabeth Town Council. The planning board is asking the town council to adopt their recommended change to the open space zoning ordinance on July 10th. This ordinance change may have implications for all town citizens and future developments. As with any proposed changes to town ordinance, we request that the town council provide an open, transparent, and thoughtful process, allow sufficient community input, provide advanced public notice on the town website and to community newspapers. We believe a change in ordinance needs community-wide input and deliberation. We request that the public process to review these recommendations allows the time necessary for community voices to be heard. And um, we have 111 people who, throughout Cape, who agree. And the names have been sent in to you, I think, all except the last five, which I just got right before the meeting. So I'd like to present the originals to you, our town council. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. My name is Pete Dixon. I live at 29 Westminster, married to Priscilla. And I'm probably responsible for 70 of those um, signatures. I stood out at the swap shop and I talked to people. A large number of people didn't know anything about it. And of some of the people that did know about it, I probably could have gotten eh, maybe 20 more signatures. They were very reluctant to sign anything that was going to go in front of the council. I don't know why. I can speculate. But it was, they were very unhappy about the way things are handled. Thank you. Hi, Paul Seidman, 21 Oakview Drive. Uh, I just had a question. I think in one of the memos to you, uh, there was um, a suggestion about a reason for moving swiftly on this had to do with um, a legal challenge or uh, potential legal challenge, and I'm not aware of any, and I was just wondering if there was documentation of that. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Becky Fernald. I um, Cape President, 313 Mitchell Road. Uh, and I just want to make sure that everyone understands this is more than just a simple clarification. Um, it had, this can have a uh, far-reaching impact on land use in our town and future developments. And I will briefly explain why. Um, the current uh, zoning or open space zoning ordinance um, was revised in uh, 2015, uh, recommendations of the planning board, the ordinance committee, and then adopted by the town council. And included in that, those changes was a specification to have agricultural land um, be classified separately as open space. And there were very um, clear, it's very clear in the ordinance as to what constitutes agricultural land for the purpose of open space. In the planning board's memo to the town council, they're um, <coughs> questioning um, why there should be a five acre minimum for agricultural open space. But the very ordinance that the planning board recommended and that the town council adopted states that the land shall be preserved in a manner that preserves active agricultural fields for agricultural use and must meet the requirements of the state law. And it, it doesn't just reference state law, it says it must meet the requirements. And the requirements are a five acre minimum. There's no doubt about it. You can look it up yourself. I'll be ha I think I've sent it to you before. but. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a layperson, regular citizen, but it's clear to me, it's clear to many people who've been asking this question of the planning board since January. 
It's nothing against this parcel of land uh, that uh, the Maxwell Woods development is pertaining to. Um, it's just saying the planning board, as I always say, we have to make our decisions based on the ordinance, and this ordinance is very clear. I find it appalling, frankly, that in the middle of a development review process where the planning board has already granted preliminary review based on the current ordinances, that now they're trying to rush through a change in an ordinance to try to justify a decision about an agricultural easement that does not comply with the current ordinance. And uh, they receive legal advice, and the lawyer has recommended amending the ordinance. Um, so to, obviously, they don't think they've made a legally defensible decision, and I find that appalling. This is, the, this is the responsibility of the planning board to follow the ordinance. We as average citizens aren't saying it must be five acres. This was a, de a decision made collectively and vetted by months and months of of uh, community groups and committees to come up with these different land use uh, revisions included in that a, a priority that we all feel strongly about is preserving our farmland. And state law says five acre minimum in many different places. And by the way, in our subdivision ordinance, it also says that farmland is defined, defined as a five acre minimum. Can you wrap up your comments? Yes. You. So um, what, I'm, what I also think is very important to understand, it's not just the size of this land. The, the change in the, in the ordinance in 2015, approved by the council, was that if, you, if a developer had uh, agricultural open space land, they could get a density bonus for their development. That means they could build more units than what was normally allowed. And the highest density bonus that a developer can get is for agricultural open space. And if this change goes through, that means a developer could get a, de a density bonus for any size of land, a quarter acre, a half an acre, three quarters of an acre. They could get a density bonus for that. This does not benefit the town. This benefits the developer. So I ask you to please make sure that this process of deciding on an ordinance is vetted thoroughly as it was back in 2015 with all the other land use provisions. This has long lasting implications on our town and on open space in Cape Elizabeth. It is so vitally important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana Stern. I live at 1 Columbus Road. And um, I find this kind of shrouded in mystery. It's some kind of emergency. Um, there's, I guess, rumored lawsuits. So it's not quite clear why this, why this change is needed on an emergency basis. And I think that the public should have some kind of idea of why this change is, is needed and why this scrap of land must be farmland. Couldn't it just be part of open space? Why does it need to be farmland? I mean, from my reading of the ordinance, maybe it's to get a bonus unit or a couple bonus units, and that does not seem to be grounds for an emergency change of ordinance during a pending review of subdivision. So I would urge the town to slow down on this and to allow a proper public hearing and to maybe provide more information about why this is so essential in, in the eyes of the planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Larry Stern. I live at 1 Columbus Road for the past 15 years. I'll keep my remarks short. I, I would second um, some of those comments. I want to read just one sentence from the uh, memorandum from the planning board to, uh, on the subject of the easement. It says the planning board, I'm just reading the first sentence, uh, the planning board acknowledges that processing ordinance amendments during a development review process is awkward. Now, I'd say it's more than, more than awkward.
awkward. It's, it's very hard for a lay person, Becky does a very good job, to get their hands around and understand what these changes mean. But I don't understand, the, again, there were rumors about a potential lawsuit, the need for rushing this through when it's such a complicated thing for the average person in the community to understand. It does, we, we can't, uh, our first uh, obligation is not to the developer, it's to all of us here. I know I sat through the earlier discussion and you talked about taking five years or more to try to resolve this, uh, this Shore Acres issue, which still isn't resolved. That seems like an awful lot of time. But on the other end, I don't know why we need to rush this through in a matter of, a matter of weeks. It seems, especially on something that is, that is so complex, it seems that we need to back up, take a little time, and understand what the ramifications may be for the town. This could affect not just its development, but other developments in the town as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public wishing to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, there's no current motion on the table, number one. Um, number two, I think there's a lot of questions from counselors, though. Um, Would you like me to make a motion? Go then? ahead. Okay. I, um, let's see. I move that the town council refer the amendment to the ordinance committee for review and to set a public hearing on Monday, August 14th, 2017 at 7 p.m. on a proposed amendment in section 19-7-2 open space zoning, section D, open space design standards, relating to a provision that agricultural land may be preserved as part of open space in new development. Thank you, is there a second to that? Council Sullivan? Discussion. Question. Yes. Um, it might be helpful for um, everyone if um, we just had maybe the town manager or the town planner go through the process because I know sometimes in the past um, people hear about something, they get kind of alarmed, um, they didn't realize what, what was happening and sometimes if we maybe go through the, what, the, what the process is, it's helpful. It may not satisfy um, their concern about what, that they don't want something to happen but it, it might help to um, for, for folks here in the room or who are going to watch this on TV. Um, to know what the process is so that they know if something comes up, this is what happens, this is what we do, this is all the steps that we take. Um, just a thought. If nobody else thinks that's good, then that's fine. I'm fine with that. If either Chair Jordan or um, Maureen, if you, either, either of you. As Maureen walks up, I can try to assist yep. a little bit as well. Uh, I mean, I know what the process is, I'm just saying. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I, I, I believe you know the process very well, Councillor Ray. <laughs> uh, what we're looking at is last month we had the initial request that came forward to, to as a number of different items related to the development of Maxwell Woods. Uh, so that was, and each, I guess it's important to note that each meeting has been duly publicly noticed and advertised within the paper uh, on our website and, and made sure that we get you know, here you hear the you all know that the count, town council of Cape Elizabeth will be meeting at such a date and such a time. So we try to make that available as soon as we can. Get that out there within the statutory requirements is what how the how it's spelled out. So we try to make sure folks can understand that if there's going to be discussed on any subject matter, uh, but specifically with ordinance changes, uh, there is a very it, it seems like it may be a rush process each time, but there it is by definition uh, attempted to be a slower process uh, to make ordinance changes where you need to have the initial uh, offering and then a, and then the ordinance re the ordinance committee will then work on it and then the council will have a public hearing and then they'll then have it as an action item uh, on their agenda so there are multiple steps along the way where where the public does have the ability to weigh in and, and advise if they have a feeling uh, of it one way or the other o outside of you know, a neon sign out front or other delivery methods, we, we try to make sure that folks are fairly well notified of what the uh, actionable items are on the agenda. Uh, just from the public process side, if, if, that, if that's helpful, uh, not for you, but for others uh, listening, I hope it is. Now, as far as the, uh, the rationale behind uh, why this request has come forward, I think uh, Maureen could probably explain this uh, in a much better manner than I could. At least I, I, I have that faith in Maureen <laughs> that she'll Thank be you. able to. So, 
And just to echo what Matt said, uh, the planning board discussed this at their June workshop. It was on the June workshop agenda. Um, it was posted to the website the week before the June meeting. At the workshop, the council, the planning board decided to hold a public hearing in June. That is something they are authorized to do under their rules as directed by the town council to change their rules to allow that. So it was on the June planning board meeting agenda. Public hearing was held. People came to that meeting. They spoke. They knew about it. We received emails about it. Um, and then at the end of June, it was forwarded to the manager to go on the council's agenda for tonight. And as you all know, that council agenda is also posted on the website. The draft amendment is posted on the website. The memo explaining why it's in front of you, as well as documentation about a potential legal challenge. And that's why it's in front of you tonight, that um, as a municipal employee, when I am made aware that there is potentially a legal challenge to actions the town is taking, and we have an opportunity to clarify ordinance language so that we can avoid, if possible, a lawsuit and the ensuing tax dollars that have to go into defending the lawsuit, it seemed reasonable to consider that. I brought that uh, concern to the planning board chair, who's here right now. Um, it then went to the planning board. And the concern is that in the ordinance right now, it says that um, you can create an agricultural easement to preserve open space as part of new development. And yes, this has been brought to our attention because of the review of the Maxwell Woods project. Frankly, we do our best in drafting ordinances. I'm looking every single one of you, I think except for Jamie, and he's going to do it tomorrow, have sat on the ordinance committee. And you all know that you do your best to write ordinances. You try to anticipate all the different scenarios of how that ordinance can be applied. But it's not unusual when you have a real world situation that you apply an ordinance and something comes up. And so an email was provided to the town that suggested that the town could be sued because the ordinance was not clear. And for that reason, we're looking at that now. The ordinance allows for open space that is agricultural land to be preserved. This current project it's about 18 acres in size. Eight acres are being proposed as open space. Of those eight acres, two acres are being proposed as an agricultural easement. It needs to be made clear. One, that this particular development is not proposing to use the density bonus for agricultural easements. So if the developer does not set aside those two acres as an agricultural easement, I believe his representative stated to you at last month's council meeting that they're just going to treat it as regular open space. And that means that the density calculations for that development do not change at all. It's exactly the same size as it is right now. And again, the developer's representative stated to you last month that the reason the developer is proposing an agricultural easement is one, the land is currently part of a farm. That farm is well over five acres in size. That farm, we have all enjoyed the strawberries that that farm grows. It's the Maxwell farm. And they have a, a farm field and related buildings that are two acres in size that they are prepared to sell to the developer. However, if they can keep using that land, keep farming that field, keep using it for back operations, that promotes agriculture. And so that's why it's being presented to the planning board as an agricultural easement, because then the farmer can retain the ownership of the land, they can continue to farm the land, they will not be able to develop the land in the future. That's it. Once you put that easement on, it's done. The current ordinance says to, in order to take advantage of this agriculture leasement, you need to meet the definition of farmland as stated in state law. And you may say, well, why are we using the state law definition? Well, that's because we tried to write a definition at the local level and we got very, very stuck. So instead of getting stuck again, we grabbed the state definition. The state definition is written for the purposes of the farmland tax law. And all we're doing is using that definition. We're not requiring that a farm be enrolled in the tax program. 
and we're saying that you just need to meet this fundamental rule for farmland. You need to generate $2,000 or more of income a year. You need to be at least five acres in size. And we've talked to our attorney and we've said, look, the agricultural easement we're talking about comes from a farm that is at least five acres in size. And he said that is a reasonable interpretation to take, that the home parcel meets the state definition and that the easement would then be a portion of the farm. There is nothing in the ordinance that says the agricultural easement itself needs to be five acres. Our attorney has said it's a reasonable interpretation to take, but he's also said if you get challenged in court, it's up to a judge to make that determination. And it would be nice to avoid the court case. So what's being proposed here is clarifying language that makes it very clear that the state definition of farmland has to be met by the home farm, but that the agricultural easement can be smaller than that. And to be fair, we also accept wetlands and greenbelt land for, to meet the open space requirements of development, and neither one of those has a minimum size. The only minimum is that the total development has to have 40% open space. Can I ask you a couple questions? Go ahead. My first question is, um, I'm just curious about the nature of this threatened lawsuit. Are you referring to the email that Mr. Seidman sent? Yes, would you like me to read it? Um, I, no, I've already read it. Um, I, I believe, I guess he can speak for himself, but I believe that was a level that was so hypothetical and um, not, I mean, I don't think that he seriously meant I'm thinking of suing or someone else might be thinking of suing. I think he was just sort of saying, is, would it be possible? And so to me, it's even not even close to rising to the level of a threat of a real lawsuit that would, that would require us to rush this through, which I agree with the people who have contacted us that it, we are in fact rushing this through. Our prior item took five years. This has been five days. I got this. I actually opened it on Thursday. I've been trying to get myself up to speed. I confess I'm as confused as all the citizens. I, I don't feel ready to, to send this forward because of the unintended consequences, which isn't to say that I'm not in favor of this development. So my second question is, is there a way for um, this development to go forward exactly as planned, exactly as he wants to, without changing this ordinance, AKA, could he simply buy those two acres from the family that wants to put in an easement, count it as his 40% open space, and continue with his plan? Well, the first question was, there's no real threat. And as a municipal employee, when I saw this, I felt that it was concerning enough that I should raise it to the planning board, and it's now been raised by the planning board to the council. As the council, it's up to you to decide if you're concerned enough about it that you want to act or whether you want to dismiss it. That is fully within the council's purview. I'm looking at the planning board chair, and I think it's fair to say that the planning board was very clear that they made a recommendation to you. It's up to you to decide if you want to act on it. Um, as for the development, the, the developer's representative stated at last month's council meeting that if they can't do an agricultural easement, and the reason they wouldn't do it is not because it doesn't appear to meet the ordinance, but because they would be concerned with a legal challenge and the time and the cost that go, would go into that. So developers, like most of us, try to minimize risk. So wait, they, wait, would, they would be they concerned would with the purchase? the agricultural easement. They would go ahead and still preserve it as open space. So they, the purchase, let's say they said, okay, they both parties agreed, we'll just purchase this two acres. And I'm not gonna speak for the developer on how he would do that. Is that, would that be legal ways. though? Would that yes, be? there's def, you def So that's an option open to them and, and that would not require changing this ordinance? I'm not saying that doing something else would require changing the ordinance. I'm just pointing out that the council, when it adopted these rules and, and the FOSS committee's recommendation, said that agricultural land is supposed to be a high priority. And this is definitely reversing what has previously been identified as a high priority for open space preservation. But it's two acres and it's asking us to change a very low, an ordinance that has many long-term implications of which I confess I don't even understand yet. So 
personally, rather than rushing this through, because I feel like we're minding the ants while the elephants run wild, I would rather take a longer time. I, I want to maybe a workshop, whatever. I just want some time for myself to understand it before I send it to the Ordinance Committee with a charge that I don't even know what to charge them. Um, but I'm saying that it, it, wouldn't be ad, it wouldn't adversely impact this Joel Fitzpatrick ability to develop this land because he could, because another month or two won't matter, or he could always choose to buy it. So we're not impinging on this particular project, whichever way we decide. It's up to the council how you want to proceed. Mm -hmm. Caitlin? A couple questions and points. Um, the planning board obviously sent this to us as a way to interpret the ordinance, and that's what's before us. Is if, if we do nothing and we send it back, the planning board, when they get the final approval of the site plan of the subdivision, can decide to interpret the ordinance as they've already interpreted it and grant an agricultural easement, and we'll do nothing. The problem is we have this email that says, if you do that, maybe you'll get sued. So that's what we're trying to avoid, is my understanding. Right? Okay. Next thing I have is the, the density bonus. A lot of people are bringing up the density bonus. If we go forward, it's going to change the density bonus. You know, even though they say they're not going to use the density bonus for this project, it potentially could change the density bonus in the future. But I'm not really seeing how that's happening. So maybe if I can talk out loud while I go through this. It says that, that you get one additional unit per 30,000 square feet, right? If we interpret it the way that you, that some of the other people want us to interpret it by keeping it at the five acres, why would the original ordinance have written it as 30,000 square feet when that is only 0.69 acres? If they wanted it to be five acres had to be preserved in order to get your density bonuses, then they would have said five acres gets you 6.5 units, which that's what it would do. Um, at the current rate of what it is, with one acre, you would get 43 square feet, 43 and a half square feet, which would only get you 1.45 additional units. So the fact that the ordinance was written in a way that it didn't count acres, it didn't count the five acres, it counted 30,000 square feet. So if you want to preserve 30,000 square feet, you get one additional density bonus unit, right? So I'm just saying that we're just clarifying what was already in there. We, we had the intention going forward that you did not need to preserve five acres. We just didn't say that before, and that's what we're needing to say now. Right. Um, the only other thing that I am a little lost on is people are saying that it's going to affect other parts of the ordinance. So maybe because you live the ordinance um, could help me in knowing is there anywhere else in the ordinance that reflects back on this definition that would be affected? You know, like they're saying it's going to have unintended consequences over with this open space definition or over here. I'm not seeing that, so I'm just wondering if you who is, you've been here, I don't even know how long, but you know and are involved in this ordinance every day. So maybe you know of any little intricacies where this definition is going to come into play with something way over here that we're not thinking of right now. Well, I have been here a long time, but this provision has only been in since 2002. But, but, you, would know, but you would know anything else that was changed. I, I, at, on the spot right now, this, this definition was added to deal with the two locations where we provide a density bonus for preservation of agricultural land. I cannot think of any other impact it would have. But if, when I come back tomorrow, if I come up with something else, I will let you know. And she's referring to it when it goes to ordinance, because all we're deciding tonight is to send it to the ordinance committee so that they can have a whole long discussion and hatch it out on what they think. And then they're going to send it back to the council to have some more discussion. Right. To clarify the process. Kathy? I would like you to read the email, please. And I'd like it to be put into the record. I, it, and honestly, it is attached to your package. I know so that. So it's posted to the website. Uh, it has been recommended to me by a source that will remain anonymous that you, we, take our emails to the PB about the co-application fiasco and edit them down to 250 choice words and points and get them into the courier. Next deadline is this Friday, May 26th. 
And while we're at it, also get an interview on this with the forecaster and current. Their lawyers need to know they're on thin ice. We need a big old spotlight on this one. Paul. Thank you. Jessica. Um, I uh, served with uh, Kayla Jordan on the FOSS committee. And where all of this, and you were on the council at the time, Sarah, although you weren't on the committee itself, uh, and we were, you know, in the depths of future open space preservation and all the concepts that go with that, that I remember you, you and uh, the time Council Governor Alley were very keen on the, the forming that committee and seeing that move forward. And I, I have to just, I have to commend the planning board because we could not figure out how to define agricultural space and easements at that time. We played around with it and we decided, whoa, we really were very uncomfortable with that. We kept farmland with the state's definition, which is for tax purposes, five acre minimum for tax purposes. And so we shied off from that in FOSS. And it, it does make sense to me, perfect sense, that it would take a, a real world situation like this one you know, to, to bring it forward. I don't, I think this is a win-win all the way around. I mean, in FOSS, the whole, one of the things we talked about forever was how do we, you know, improve agricultural land? How do we make sure that that is the highest priority? What can we do to, to facilitate agricultural easements and so forth? And here we have an opportunity to do it. This development, as I understand it, is going to be developed whether there is an agriculture, an agricultural easement or not. Am I right? Most likely. Okay, it's going to be developed whether or not there is open space. If, whether this two acres is open space or agricultural easement, right? If we have a goal, as, as was rampant throughout FOSP, as well as land use, as well as, you know, time and time again affirmed by the town citizenry that preserve, preserving farm, farmland is the highest priority, then why is this a problem? I mean, here's open space that could be used to grow food. And so I just don't see that this is any, this uh, to me is a win-win any way you look at it. I think, and I don't, again, I don't understand the complexities yet, but I think their concern is that actually this won't benefit farmland and it will enable larger developments with more density to go in. And, and the reason is that I think that this ordinance is allowing a developer to say, I'm going to buy this thin strip of land that's growing crabgrass over here on the, you know, somewhere. Um, and I'm going to count that as, my, as farmland because this owner also has a thriving nice farm. It happens to be across town, but whatever. So then they say, oh, that's farmland, open space. And then you start to break up. I mean, one of the, one of the core tenets of the open space Findings, much as we all struggled with it, was that it's that it's it's beneficial in a chunk, and you want people to be able to use it. So you know, we tried to avoid thin strips, you know, that go around it, or a thin strip on the side of the road that goes in. That I mean, you can count it as open space, but what they wanted was quality open space. If you can use little pieces to qualify as farmland, I think you're actually detracting from preserving working farms. That's what the fear is. I, I, Council Jordan. Three points. Number one, I want to go back to the point of why doesn't the developer just buy the property? The developer is buying Can you develop speak up, Sorry. Yeah. Oh, the developer is so you got uh, the developer is purchasing development rights. The farmer has a a right to retain uh, ownership of that property. So you sell your development rights. Again, their farm is not across town. Their farm is in two locations. And this is contiguous land. And if you go to, uh, if you go to the definition and you truly interpret it the way that it was intended to be t interpreted at a state level, what they were talking about is contiguous property. It's not you take and you have to create a five-acre parcel. But is this one saying it has to be contiguous? Yeah. Yes. It is. So you ha you can you can count two acres, but it has to be right next to. You're, you're part of a contiguous land. It's a contiguous farm, 
You've got the property on Spruink Avenue. You've got the property on 77. I know this one is. I'm not, I'm not worried about this at all. I'm happy for him to do well, that. You're getting, we could make an exception. You're getting into a whole different thing, which is then you can get into transfer of development well, rights and all of those things. Because we're changing an ordinance. If we were just saying, hey, I want to give this guy an exception, let's let him do it, I'd be like, yeah, right. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about changing the fundamental I think, rule. I think what we're doing is we are doing exactly what Jessica said. We are taking and now understanding how you peel the onion on it. Okay. Jessica said, Jess, Jessica sat on FOSS. She understands that you can only make a stab at something and then you overlay a real world example. We have a real world example. And now we can put definition around it. We can go to Caitlin's point of why did they use 30, 30 whatever, 30,000 square feet or whatever it was. It, it's because they had not been able to fully define because they didn't have a real life example to overlay it. If I had to say unintended consequences, do I want development rampant in town? No. But I don't think this is the, the thing that it's going to create this ripple effect of development across town. Well, I think we should just find out what the implications Well, it's been going on for more than five days. I've been to at least five meetings on it. Okay, well, I'm saying I just got her memo. Then that's our you panel. just got it. Well, I don't think I should have to go to the planning board and read their minutes to know what's going to be before. I think if you want to be informed about what's going on in the town and you're going to sit here and you're going to uh, I'm just saying make statements know. that aren't even accurate. I don't know if it's accurate or not because in our package I got this thing that said this is an immediate rush. You have to send it to the ordinance committee the next day at noon. Then I get a letter signed by over 100 citizens saying we have deep concerns about this. And I'm like, this feels like a rush to me. I don't... I, the next day at noon, where, okay, I know citizens can go because most people have a job. I mean, I'm busy. So I'm just saying I'm not opposed to it. I'm simply saying I don't understand it. And we got, I think, dozens of emails okay. and a signed letter. I think we got three people on an ordinance committee who can sit down okay. and make an intelligent decision. I hope so. Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, I'd also like to point out that this was at the request of the farmer, not the developer. The developer doesn't care. Open space, air coffee, amusement, whatever you want. The farmer wants this. Councilor Jordan. A couple of points. Um, since we started the new year, we have had our ordinance committee meetings the following Tuesday after every meeting. So it just got lucky that we have our meeting tomorrow. It has nothing to do with this. That's my first point. Second point is, I think you're, you're getting lost in that no matter what five years from now, ten years from now, the definition isn't changing that you need five acres. You still need five acres. You just can only, you don't have to preserve or put an easement on the whole five acres. And honestly, if you want to get the density bonus, then you need to preserve 0.69 acres, which is not too shabby of some open space. It's not a little sliver of a backyard. I mean, people have houses on less than that much in this town, correct? I mean, yeah. the, we can put, what's the smallest? Thank you. So you, this would be plenty of open space, agricultural open space, in order to get your density bonus if you're worried about having slivers cut out of backyards. I think those are all my points. <laughs> one final thing. Does anyone else have anything? Go ahead. Can I call Mr. Seidman back up? I just want to clarify this legal thing because I don't. It's not, it's not sitting with me yet. Because it's sort of the backbone for why this came to us and why we're, I feel like we're rushing it, but you guys don't. So, to whom was that email address? What's that? To whom was that email address? That was addressed to a group, uh, an email group of people who had come to a meeting months and months ago um, with concerns about, uh, about aspects of, of the development. Did you intend for it to be sent to the planning board? No, it wasn't sent to the planning board. The planner? No, wasn't so sent it, was to, it wasn't sent to any town official at all. It was just sent to a group of citizens. So it was a private email? It was private. So your allusion to this, we should talk to someone about a lawsuit, could have been a casual conversation. It doesn't even say that we should talk to an attorney. It said on advice of a friend, it's possible. It just said they're on shaky ground. I think they're on shaky ground. That's an opinion. It's not a legal challenge. So is there any substance to that? Were you intending to make a, a veiled threat of a lawsuit or was it just 
speculating and trying to rally people to get some energy going. <laughs> I'm putting words in your mouth. What was your intention? Yes. What was your background for? What was your information and what was your intention? Uh, there was never any legal challenge. There was never any discussion of a legal challenge. In fact, there is no legal challenge. And the fact that a private email that apparently, that I know that one of the people in that email list sent it to somebody and my understanding, this was redacted when it was posted as a supporting document for a planning board meeting. Um, none of the people on the email list were redacted, but who, how it got to the town is, has been redacted. So I don't actually know how it ended up in uh, the town planner's hand, but there, I think the wording is pretty clear. There is no legal challenge. There was never intended to be. I certainly, it never occurred to me. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, <laughs> um, I work you know, in, to help with organizing things in town as a concerned citizen about various issues, as you know, but there's no legal challenge here. And I think the fact that it's being used as an argument is um, really unfortunate. And may I just say, going forward this process, I think if one person sends a personal email to some other people and it happens to be forwarded by one of the private recipients, that is not grounds to make it part of the public record. That's my opinion. It's happened to me before. It feels, it feels very intrusive, and I think we should set some ground rules about that. I don't think this letter should ever have been sent to the planning board or to us or put in the public record. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. I agree. Matt, just a, couple, on that? just a couple of quick things on that, just from the freedom of access segment. Okay. We don't have a choice. When it comes to that, if it if it's mailed into the town, if if, you, if we like it or don't like it, unfortunately, it comes into the town office. It becomes a public document, uh, whether it keeps us in the best light or in the worst light. And so if I write an email to my friend and someone happens to hack it, find it, whatever, by mistake, it ends up that is then legitimate for the the staff in charge to send it to that entire committee. Unfortunately, and make it a public record. Unfortunately, it becomes a public document. So no one should email anything anymore. <laughs> Word, word to the wise, Councilor. Yes, you're, you're accurate. Thank um, you for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, one other. Go ahead. Uh, under the concept of the of the farmland statute, uh, the way that it's interpreted in farm and open space on the taxation side of it, uh, the five acres do not need to be contiguous. They can be separated by a road, or they can be in separate parts. Uh, it's how they've how they've considered that over the years. Uh, the state has provided guidance to assessors, so. You may have a farmer who has this one errant parcel across town, but he's filed for farm and open space classification. That that may be two acres, and it's in in another town, or it could be in another section of town, not contiguous. But if it's under that one application, they they have provided that flexibility in order to include that in the five acre minimum minimum parcel. And then the other part portion is. Not all five acres in that process need to be actively farmed. Uh, ultimately, that's the minimum requirement that you need. Uh, so, you know, they may be someone who has a five acre parcel and they have greenhouses on there. Well, the greenhouses aren't going to take up five acres. They may have a farm, uh, they may have a house there, they may have you know, lawn area, they may have tree growth in there. So it's not all dedicated to actually active agricultural pursuits. Uh, the five acres is just the minimum lot size that you need to have. And again, it can be in separate sections. Do I, the, you know, over 25 years of being an assessor, uh, did I ever agree with that interpretation? Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, they've provided that interpretation to us over the years, and there are cases in town. Uh, Spray Corporation has parcels that are under farm classification that are less than five acres, but they have roughly 2,000 acres uh, in different and various uh, forms of state programs. So. I just want to jump in for a second, um, especially mindful of the hour. Um, so all we're being asked to do today is refer this to the Ordinance Committee for them to um, deliberate on tomorrow at their meeting. And then subsequent to that, there is going to be a public hearing, potentially, on the 14th of August, at which time we may or may not choose to take action on the item. Um, Sometimes we vote on an ordinance immediately following public hearing. Sometimes we don't. So that's up for scheduling and, you know, how it gets worked on the agenda. And it's also, um, even when it gets to the point of us voting on the ordinance, um, you know, if people disagree with it at that point, then, you know, you can, you can vote against it at that point. I guess what I'm not clear out 
clear on about all of this, understanding people's concerns about rushing. Um, all, all that's being asked to do is have a, a subgroup of this council further work on this issue and continue the process. I, I'm not, it, it, it feels like there are still opportunities to put the brakes on if we feel like we need to. I, I don't know if I'm missing something, that's all. Yeah. I'll go ahead. Say that I, I think tomorrow when we work, if this were again approved, we would go in as the ordinance committee and look at those implications and kind of um, break it apart. And I, I do really feel like I think that there, there's questions of process. It, it is awkward what the in, um, the implications are, but the intent here is sound. And again, just to reiterate, this subdivision is going to happen exactly at 46 units, whether or not we give this. I, I think the intent is actually to preserve some working farmland. If we decide that what we come up with is going to have some unintended consequences and will be um, um, not good for the town long term, then we will take it off the table. I'm confident that this council will do that. So I think we should move forward to a vote. Any other discussion? Seeing, yeah. yeah, I just I would just like to put a word in for the planning board because a few years ago they were under fire for not working fast enough and people were backlogged and people were thinking that you know their their issues weren't being moved along. And uh, I, you know, this is um, this is, I think, a very fine example of they're trying to meet the needs of everyone involved, and also with a great deal of respect for the intent of FOSS committee and land use and land use regulations in the comp plan. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion on the table to refer uh, the amendment this amendment to the Ordinance Committee for review. Uh, and that review would take place at tomorrow's noon meeting of the Ordinance Committee. And to set a public hearing on Monday, August 14th at 7 p.m. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Thank you. Next item is number 103-2017. I'm gonna turn to on what? Is, it, is there a chance to make a comment on this? This is the town website. I will bet you that 50% of the people here can't find the agenda. Half of the people that I talked to at the, at the, uh, the, the swap shop the other day had no idea what was going on. They knew there was a town council meeting, but they had no idea what the subject was. And I'll bet you, half, I, I don't know, can, all, can any of you get it? Can you come up with the ordinance or what, what the, the uh, agenda was tonight? Mm -hmm. you just, yeah, yeah, you spoke on the top left. Right on the left-hand exactly. side. Sure, it's what? Sure, sure. Click on camera. Uh, yeah. Believe me, an awful lot of people don't know what's going on because none of this is in the paper. Thank you. If you want. I, I just want I just want it to be clear that on the in on the on the website in the top left hand corner it says July tenth, two thousand seventeen count town council, Monday seven PM C link for agenda and that's live linked right there. It's at the top left hand corner. Sure. At least tell them how to go to the website and tell them how to find the order. It is not We should put it in the courier. It's been in the courier. We should put it back in again. It's good again. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm meeting the deadlines for the meetings in the courier. Okay. Yeah. Item number 103-2017. Uh, we're discussing marijuana regulations. I'll turn it over to um, Councilor Grennan, Chair of the Ordinance Committee. Yes. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, Okay, so um, as you all know, the Town Council referred to the Ordinance Committee a review of the recently adopted recreational marijuana referendum. In February, the Town Council adopted a moratorium on recreational marijuana uses, which expires in September of 2017. The Ordinance Committee met six times to review, research, and discuss possible marijuana uses in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so I'd like to take a few minutes, if it's okay with you, um, to provide you with an overview of the process we undertook 
as well as uh, provide you with our committee recommendation. Um, so the, the state of Maine has two main marijuana use laws, um, the medical marijuana law and the recreational marijuana use law. The recreational marijuana referendum includes substantial opportunity for local regulation and recreational marijuana in five specific areas, cultivation, testing, manufacturing, retail sales, and social clubs. While there is almost no opportunity for local regulation of medical marijuana uses, um, and we must also know that personal use is allowed under state law and the, therefore is not going to be part of our recommendation. So the first step we took um, was we knew that we had to get educated uh, on this subject as a committee. So in February we attended a conference by the, um, um, offered by the Maine Municipal Association that reviewed the current law and provided overviews and pictures of marijuana um, facilities operating in Colorado. I think, as we all know, that's kind of the, uh, the best example in our country um, currently. We learned that marijuana cultivation, testing, and manufacturing operates as an industrial use. As well, um, we were provided information about the impacts of retail sales and social clubs. Police Chief, Police Chief Neil Williams attended most, if not all, the committee, committee meetings. As well, he attended the Maine Municipal Association uh, municipal Association training with us. He informed the committee about a history of odor complaints from marijuana growing in Cape Elizabeth as well as expressed a concern that retail marijuana sales might increase the incidence of drug driving in Cape. So while the police chief attended our meetings, uh, no members of the public attended any of our committee meetings. So let me take you through each of the five potential uses we could now allow in Cape Elizabeth if we deemed it appropriate. The first is for um, social clubs and retail sales. Um, both social clubs, and a social club would be like a bar for smoking pot and maybe doing edibles and things like that. Um, that would be a social activity um, with marijuana. And retail sales, which would be um, places to sell um, marijuana that would not be like at the IGA or something in town. It would have to be its own standalone business. And so when we refer to those two things, that's what we're referring to. Um, and those operations would, we thought as a committee, would most likely be located in a commercial district in town. So we have a couple different places that we looked at. Um, the first is the town center district. Um, and when we looked at that, we looked at that there was a, a huge school campus. And as well, we had many, many adjoining densely zoned neighborhoods um, right there. So as a committee, we didn't feel that this was an appropriate place for social clubs or um, uh, retail sales. We also looked at the BA Business District, and um, this is down by like the Good Table and where Rudy's, the old Rudy's used to exist. And um, we also integrated, um, it, was, it is um, completely integrated with adjacent neighborhoods, and so therefore, felt as, as well, it was not a compatible use. The RA district, which covers about 50% of the town, um, and also has some of the more um, outlying, um, more open space areas that you could potentially put something. Um, but wherever we looked, we again felt like it was, you always had a residential neighborhood. So we concluded, therefore, that no locations were um, appropriate in Cape Elizabeth for marijuana retail sales or social clubs. So the next thing we looked at was uh, manufacturing and testing. And um, as I said earlier, that these are considered industrial uses in um, other states that have um, legalized marijuana. And since we do not have an industrial zone in Cape Elizabeth, we concluded that manufacturing and testing are not appropriate uses in Cape Elizabeth. Last we looked at, uh, thing we looked at was cultivation. And we actually spent a great deal, deal of time discussing this. We compared the medical marijuana provisions to the recreational marijuana referendum. We considered the potential revenue opportunities for residents who want to grow marijuana commercially and neighborhood impacts like odor and security. Uh, we as a committee, um, which I didn't mention, involves um, Caitlin and um, Councillor Ray, um, we considered a minimum lot size for growing marijuana and analyzed lots um, creating a map with two, three, four, five, ten, 10, and 15 acre parcels. And considered that um, marijuana cultivation um, for commercial use would occur inside buildings to min um, excuse me, minimize 
species contamination. And because of all this, and that there is no place that parcels were big enough to not impact surrounding neighborhoods, we concluded that cultivation in Cape should be prohibited for now. Um, certainly, this could be revised after state regulations are completed and impacts in other communities um, could be assessed. And so we really went with a, let's um, take a wait and see um, approach, learn from other communities before allowing growing and cultivation in Cape Elizabeth. So um, we did come up with a recommendation. Um, you have it in your packet, excuse me as I fumble. Um, the, ordinance, or the ordinance committee is recommending that a standalone marijuana ordinance be adopted that prohibits recreational marijuana cultivation, manufacturing, testing, retail sales, and social clubs. The ordinance has been drafted by town attorney John Wall. A standalone ordinance can be adopted using a streamlined process, process which can be completed prior to the September moratorium expiration. A separate ordinance will be um, easier to amend if needed after the state recreational marijuana provisions are completed. So um, at this point, I can either make a motion, um, Jamie, or if you wanted to invite people to speak or- um, Yeah, you before you make a motion, thank, first of all, thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you to the committee for their work. Um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak about this? No, okay. Go ahead. Okay, do I make a motion? Okay, great. I move to set a public hearing on Monday, August 14, 2017 at 7 p.m. regarding the Ordinance Committee's proposed ordinance prohibiting retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. Is there a second? Council Lennon, any discussion? Council Feldman. I'd like to commend the Ordinance Committee. I think uh, they have done a beautiful job of tackling something that I think is really confusing. And um, I liked very much uh, the approach of looking at all of the zones in town um, to see what would be currently allowed with the zoning that exists. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the chart that they made. You know, you really did a great job simplifying as much as possible what is a pretty complex issue, particularly as this is uncharted territory for everyone. So I, I just think you really did an outstanding job dissecting this and putting it together in a manner that made it a lot easier for us to, to, um, to get there. So thank you. thank you. Any other discussion? I just have two quick questions. Go ahead. So when it says prohibits recreational marijuana, does that include medicinal, or is that a whole different ball of wax? No, we didn't even um, tackle um, the medical marijuana. That okay. is a state law regulated and is allowable, and that's not even part of this. This is recreational is for um, uh, for retail sales. Okay. Part of the law. Right, because it, it doesn't touch personal growth and use. It's just um, recreational. Probably isn't the right word for it because it's it's commercial growth. Retail, yeah, retail, yes, it's, it's all, okay. Okay. okay, okay, so in other words, if a, if a medical marijuana dispensary wanted to start a field somewhere on their property, grow this and sell it for medical marijuana, they would be allowed to? There are state regulations around that. They need to apply for all those permits and everything else, and then, um, and it's pretty confidential, actually. They don't mm -hmm. release where they are and what oh. they are. Yeah, so. Second, like, second, be inside. second question is. And they don't grow it in fields because oh, sorry. <laughs> it's got to be secure. It's got to be secure. Oh. My second and question is, ten. if one person wanted to like grow one plant on their windowsill, is that okay or prohibited? You okay. can ask up to six. Personal use. Oh, okay, because recreational sounds like recreational. But That's what I was saying. It's so personal is okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, personal is okay. The, there are rules around that. Okay. And you have to know what they are if you are going to. I have no interest, but I'm just saying. The best. So the best clarification, I said it several times throughout, is like you can have three neighbors in a row. One can grow for medical and either for their medical use or medical patients and sell it to their patients. The next neighbor can grow it and use it themselves, but the third neighbor can't grow it and sell it to his buddy down the street. Got it. He can give it to him. Yes, if he wants to. <laughs> like right other? now. But good. that was like the, the simplest way to break it down that I could come up with. Any other discussion, Kathy? The only thing I'd add is I think a lot of times what, as we went through these meetings and, and all this stuff, and uh, we couldn't have done it without Maureen. There's just oh. no way. Thank but you, um, the, the piece that kept coming back was the smell. 
because as we went through this and we discussed this a lot, the smell was an issue. And so I think that helped us to formulate where we landed because there are people that do not like the smell. And if we had some of these retail establishments, they would be able to be s s smelled <laughs> by the neighbors. And we are fairly dense in terms of being near each other. And so, yeah, so that was a, a, a big driving force between the, for, for the recommendation, I felt. Any other discussion? I have something. And I don't want to belabor this, but I, I, I do appreciate all of the work you guys did. But I do want to go on record that I don't necessarily agree with the conclusion. Uh, I really think that it could have been um, each thing as you address them uh, um, could have determined how to mitigate it. I agree that social clubs and retail sales not in, in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I, I think that there could have been ways and there may be ways in the future that manufacturing and testing and, um, and cultivation could happen in town. I think if odor was the biggest problem when you talk about cultivation and uh, manufacturing and testing, there are ways you can mitigate that. And I think we could have put something in place that said that, um, that um, products, uh, marijuana that's going to be grown for recreational purposes uh, or sales, whether it be uh, wholesale sales, um, that um, they have to be grown inside a structure and that there needs to be odor mitigation. So I would just say that I think that this is an okay first step, but I think that we need to get a little bit more progressive in how we address new things that come onto our table. Um, what, I'm sorry, did I I'm and, and And I say that because, uh, and I could go on and on, but the clock is ticking, yeah. that it's a slippery slope that you create here. You talk about large structures um, that have some manufacturing and testing going on inside or manufacturing. We have places in town where manufacturing does occur. And uh, not that I want to, this isn't the business I want to get into, but it's, uh, it are, it, they are things that we really need to think about that you're uh, you could have something that precludes other things from happening if you have this too narrow. Yeah. You Very mean, briefly, please. Okay, sorry. sorry. It makes a really good point. <laughs> I do feel like that, again, I, I think where we landed was that um, this is a wait and see thing, and it certainly is something that we can come back and visit a year from now as we know what other surrounding communities are doing. So, um, points well taken. Okay. If there's no other. Discussion, uh, call the question. All those in favor of the motion to set a public hearing for Monday, August 14th, regarding the Ordinance Committee's proposed ordinance prohibiting retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. Opposed? Thank you. Next item is 104-2017. Um, Matt, you have a request um, for us to refer to the Ordinance Committee uh, some amendment language on domestic foul. Yes, uh, uh, I have uh, put this on here. Uh, Councillor Ray and Councillor Penny Jordan also received uh, emails. There's been an issue that has arisen recently uh, within neighborhoods with domestic foul. Uh, uh, I guess to summarize it briefly, not not um, being attentive to property lines. Uh, they're free ranging within neighborhoods and crossing over onto other on, onto other neighbors' properties and. I know if Councilor Jordan may, I think you'd like to speak on this if, if you'd like yes. to, to get us to get uh, This actually, this issue, this challenge is kind of near and dear. Um, because I really am a firm supporter of people growing their own food, but I, I really think that people need to be cognizant of when they uh, have uh, animals that can run around, whether it be chickens or geese or turkeys or uh, ducks, that they need to be aware of that they're in a neighborhood. And so uh, I really am in firm support that uh, we need to refer to the Ordinance Committee um, that... Um, we look at a proposed amendment uh, to some of the miscellaneous offenses in ordinance language to contain these domestic animals because I think that 
neighbors who are allowing chickens to run, they really need to pen them in. And so I would put forward that uh, if the ordinance committee could look at this, it would be beneficial to neighborhoods. And it's, it's specific to item uh, section 12-1-2 of the miscellaneous offenses. And right now, uh, it, it specifically has language uh, tailored towards roosters and then and the limitation with them on a 40,000 square foot area. Uh, we have worked with Maureen as far as coming up with the revised language to provide to the ordinance committee that they can look at and it has, it expands it some. And it's actually taking uh, the sheet off from the recommendation that was made a few years back, I think 2014. The consideration was also made at that point in time uh, about it. But we did have, over that period of time, we had multiple calls to the animal control officer as well as the police department in response to the, uh, the offending foul, if you will. But it's not just on one property, it's been in other, in other properties as well. So I want to say that it's a response to one specific issue that we need to change the ordinance, but it has been an ongoing issue at different times over the, over the past few years, and that's why uh, the recommendations have been made to, to move it down that, that avenue. But I have that rec recommendations right. ready to provide to the ordinance committee as well. Lieutenant, do you want to put yours in the form of a motion, please? I put this in the form of a motion. Okay, my motion. My motion is um, that the motion is to refer to the ordinance committee a proposed amendment to the miscellaneous offense uh, offenses ordinance language to contain domestic fowl within the owner's property. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Kathy, any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much. Next item is 105-2017, the proposed shared borrowing agreement um, memorandum of understanding between the Thomas More Library and other local libraries. Kyle, thank you for hanging in there with us tonight. I know it's late. Is there anything that you want to do? As Kyle comes up, I can, I'll try to fill in quickly for him on that. This is expanding uh, the regional efforts that were almost in many ways established when the TNL was closed during the renovation process. So, uh, Kyle, if you want to grab the ball and run from there. Yeah, actually, it, it, it largely kind of derived that. The idea amongst the libraries really kind of derived from that initial uh, pilot when we were under renovation and we had the agreements with Scarborough and South Portland. There was some indication among uh, not only the librarians, but also among a lot of members of the public that this is something that they really liked and what they really found uh, useful to be able to do this. And, and so out of that kind of grew this idea is, well, what, what if we made it something a little bit more permanent and what if we continue to, to expand it? Um, this is really the first project of its kind in Maine. It's, it's very, very common in other states. Um, one of the most common uh, bit, bits of feedback we get when people first move into Cape from out of state is I can only go to one library with my card. Um, Maine, for various reasons, is behind on that, and we're really hoping that, that we can change this. Uh, the state library, the state librarian, has been involved, uh, not informing it, but we've kept him in the loop, and he's been very interested, and there's hopes that this group can kind of serve as a pilot um, and, and to kind of help other areas and, and, and other libraries kind of replicate this. So we're, we're very excited about the potential. Um, th there will be growing pains um, w with it, um, being that it's the first of its kind, but, but I, all of us work very well together. We have very good communication. Um, so it, it's something that we're, we're very excited about being able to try. Any questions for Kyle? No, one, one other point I could just provide uh, in furtherance of this is the council stated goal to explore regionalization opportunities. Uh, this, I think, tries to follow within lockstep with that concept as well. Great. Council? Quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised there were two votes in opposition. Can you tell us what their point was? So there was the the process of implementation across the five libraries did not go as smoothly as I think all of us would have hoped. Um, there was some wording that a couple of members of the committee would like to have seen changed, wording that did not change the spirit of the document, that um, clarified it for them. Unfortunately, by the time we met and that feedback was provided to the group, one of the libraries had already received approval of the document, unbeknownst to the others. Um, and it has been acknowledged multiple times further on that, yeah, we should have done a better job of communicating our own approval process with our respective boards or councils, depending on how the libraries were governed. 
Um, and, and unfortunately, that, that didn't happen. It's something that we've now recognized, the other libraries have now recognized. Um, some of the committee members, because of that experience, were concerned about their voices and CAPE's voice being heard um, um, throughout the process and as we continue to revise it. I feel like that the lesson for the group of libraries has been learned and it won't be repeated, um, but, but they maintain that concern. So that, that is largely where that is derived from. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Kyle? Thank you very much. So um, I'll be looking for a motion to authorize the town manager to sign the memorandum of understanding for the share of borrowing services. I so move. Councilor Solomon, second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? Solomon. Yes? Point. Um, I totally respect all the work that goes into putting the agenda forward, but um, maybe in the future we can be more cognizant of the fact that he had to sit here through a long agenda that maybe we could have moved this up to the front. If we know something like this where a staff member is going to have to sit at the meeting, we could try and do a better job of getting it up front. That's all. Duly noted, Council President. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I just want discussion? a company. <laughs> I hope we'll get overtime pay. Double. All those yeah. in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate Thanks, it. Kyle. Well done. Last item is number 106-2017, amending the vote authorizing the printer photocopier lease purchase. I think this is pretty straightforward, but we're going with a different bank. Yep. Yeah, this is uh, ultimately comes down to uh, the different savings uh, offers what they call a um, uh, commercial promissory note, which was not the product that we needed to actualize this deal. Uh, and Wisconsin Savings Bank does offer a lease purchase uh, process, and uh, ultimately, you know, we're looking at a, a, a 3.01 percent rate for five years uh, to do the, the, the purchase and all that. It's the same uh, purchase amount, a little bit more interest, but, but over the five-year period. Is there a motion to amend the uh, lease purchase uh, agreement as described? Council Sullivan. I so move. Second. Second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, all those in favor? It's unanimous. We are at 10 o'clock, folks, and our council rules indicate that we cannot take up new items after 10 o'clock. Um, without a vote. Without a vote. Right. So yeah, vote. the council can vote to do so. Yep. So we need to do that. <laughs> uh, if, it's, if it's any uh, solve on the wound whatsoever, uh, I have a feeling we can be done by 10.05. Uh, <laughs> this is the lightning round segment of the agenda. Yeah. So. You don't know that, do you? <laughs> it's not a guarantee. <laughs> Council? I, I move that we uh, proceed past uh, the 10 o'clock hour in order to finish the agenda items before us. Is there a second? second. Councilor uh, Penny Jordan, all those in favor? Or any discussion? All those in favor? Great, thank you. Item number 107-2017, Fort Williams Park Group Use Request for uh, a walk event. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is an event that is uh, scheduled to, it's the end of a seven-day walk uh, that is uh, destined to conclude at Fort Williams. Uh, but it's run by uh, Dave McGilvery Sports Enterprises, uh, so he's a known commodity, as, as we all know him, from Running Beach to Beacon and uh, a little little-known event in Boston as well as well as other races. So um, they're coming forward for this request to use it on September 16th. Each runner or each walker will be assessed a fee of $5 per uh, registered entrant, as well as they're paying an area fee of $500. And if there are any additional costs that are incurred to that, they will, they will bear those as well. Uh, the, the committee voted five to one to approve. I do not know what the uh, dissenting vote was related to, but I would say that with a super majority, it was uh, it may have been a point that wasn't uh, wasn't heavily favored by the rest of the group, but uh, the recommend recommendation is to approve their 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 use on September 16th, and uh, at the additional cost that they have identified. Is there a motion, Council Grennan? I move that we approve the Fort Williams Park Group Use Request for Everwalk. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Council Lennon. Discussion. I have a quick question. Um, do you know the time of the event and the general area? I think they're looking at the at the afternoon and I th was it in the request? I believe it was in to the three o'clock. Okay, yeah. Because they expect a finish time of approximately three hundred walkers. 
at the parking lot right at the center of the court. Okay. Right across from Cliff Walk. Yep, yep, exactly. Up on the, that upper that upper lot. I just ask if anybody has concerns that it's a still high tourist season and B um, a lot of youth soccer going on on a Saturday there. That's all. Yeah, that's it. I thought I thought about the same things because it's going. I assume there's other people who are going to be parking besides the people participate because it says three to uh, two to four vehicles, vans and cars. But I would hope these walkers have some friends that might want to come see them. So it's, it seems to me there could be a lot of traffic around the fort, Possibly. which is, a pro I think, yeah. it would, a congested area already. And uh, how are they going to manage that? I remember on part of the discussion on email traffic, at least, that they were thinking that you know, they, it wasn't going to be as large as, say, if you had 300 individual walkers all coming with their own vehicles versus potentially more, more carpooling. But, uh, I don't think that committee... Those are the walkers. Yeah, yeah, most They don't the have any friends. They may have some support. But yeah. I, I think the thought was that they could be contained within that within that area. And they'll manage the parking? They will. Yeah, they're supposed to take care of all, all that additional... Is it going to be pieces. like the lobster roll thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, God, I hope not. <laughs> I just, I, I think it's ironic that... You know, an event that's considerably smaller than Beach Beacon might actually elicit more concern. That's all. Okay, so uh, have we, uh, have they ever been at Four Williams before? No, this is a, this, this is, is a first time event. Yeah. I think this may be a, I think this may be a one time, a, a one time event. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, I, I'm certainly inclined to support the committee, but in lieu of a lot of things, you know, one more group, and once they come in, they'll likely want to be here next year, and this is part of what I've been concerned about with Fort Williams all along, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly willing to support the committee's yeah. decision, but with with the reservations, I guess. And I, I can get clarification if they're planning on having this request on an annual basis as well when I reach out to them, yeah. just to let them know there's some concern about that. Councilor Jordan? Oh not privy to youth soccer where does youth soccer occur on saturday mornings at the port on the parade on the athletic no down on the athletic field so on the other side of the port or down oh, down near the, the playground field. near the kids playground yeah on that really far field up by the multi-purpose right that's what i'm saying way on the dogs. soccer fields but that's what i'm saying so there's not like there's going to be soccer teams playing on the parade field where they're going to be finishing correct like we used to do t-ball on that field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. But I, they don't do soccer. I just, I. No, I'm just saying. I mean, September is still really busy with tourists. Yes, but I just wanted. Ships. I just so, wanted to make sure yeah. that there wasn't soccer scheduled to be happening there. That we're now going to be. No, 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 not on that. Not being displaced. No. Okay, that's what yeah, I was. No, I understand your question. Okay. Just that's one more question, probably for Matt. But so they're they're scheduled to be done at three. Uh, who monitors to make sure they're really done and then exiting? My, my only thought is, what if the walk is done at 3 and then they're, they're planning, you know, to party sort of there and hang around for a while? Just a thought. I think it would be the Rangers. Okay. We, we can get the Rangers' okay. responsibility to, to, to okay. share with that, if you will. Sorry, just one quick thing. Yep. Um, I 100% agree with Jessica that we need to review this in a really gestaltic way, and I'm really looking forward to that conversation. In the meantime, I feel like it's not fair for us to really say anything to them about, I don't know about next year, because we haven't really said that to anyone else. I mean, it's just their application just happens to be slightly later. So I would just say, I mean, what if they turn out to be great customers and we double our rates and they say, okay. So I would just say, yes, you're more than welcome. And then, then we have the conversation and then we start to figure out, do we charge more? You know, we have a huge conversation ahead of us. But that's, it's not their fault that we haven't had this conversation yet. So I just would treat them like we treat everyone else. Like, we're so glad you're using it. Have a great time and you better be out of there by 301. But say they said 5:30. Yeah, they have a couple hours. They're, they're gonna. The walkers are going to arrive oh, between 1:30 okay. and 3. And then yeah, they, then they clear they break down and yeah. stuff. Oh, okay. But okay. okay. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of approved use. Unanimous. Thank you. All right. Um, item number 108-2017. Nomination to the Opportunity Alliance Board of Directors. Yeah. This is uh, this is a request from the Opportunity Alliance, which uh, in a former iteration was such organizations as Abraham Volunteers, Preble Street Resource oh, Center, oh, okay. and other social service agencies within Portland, where they merged a few years back and became Opportunity Alliance. 
and uh, they have a board of directors, which is partially uh, populated by municipal uh, municipal members or members who represent towns and cities, and then they also have members who represent uh, the business interests. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, uh, Tom Satterley was the town's representative on their on their board of directors. Uh, Tom no longer populates that position. Tim Soley has for years been on as a, on the business side of the uh, of the board of directors, and has asked. Uh, well, they they looked up to Tim and said, "Would you mind being on as a municipal uh, representative?" And he agreed to that. But uh, they contacted me and asked me to appoint him, and I said, uh, "I'm not in the appointment appointment business, but I know seven people who are, so that's why this is on the agenda." And uh, Tim has been involved with them. Uh, he has been a very active member. I think. Obviously, uh, you know Tim. He, you know he does a heck of a job, and will do a great job representing the town on their on their board. And he has a real strong interest in it. Great. And there were no other uh, appointments uh, to consider, so it's not choosing one over another person. Uh, there's there's only one candidate to, to have. Could I have a motion to approve the appointment of Tim Soley to the Opportunity Alliance Board of Directors for a three-year term, please, Councilor Soley? I, I move that we nominate Tim Soley to represent Cape Elizabeth on the Opportunity Alliance for a three-year term. Second, Councilor Brennan. Any discussion? All those in favor? Great. And the real last item, number 109-2017, the proposed carry forward balances. What we have here are uh, items um, that can just to carry forward from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018. These are items that were uh, either in, in, in process or had been planned but did not get executed in the spring or during the course of the year but will be executed within the next year. Uh, there was one item, if I could make a request that we amend this list, uh, item number 7154136, which is about halfway down the page for $3,000. Um, if we could, uh, I'd like to delete that from the list after speaking with Bob Malley. Uh, that, that item was taken care of. I'd put that in there as a precautionary thinking it was a, a different asset uh, for, as, for a mowing machine. And uh, we purchased that, and we actually came in three thousand dollars under budget. So uh, that's a good thing, but that's why I want to have it dropped from the list if we could. But everything else, we're looking at uh, executing within the next twelve months. Uh, the large ticket items, obviously, you can see them. The recycling center is currently in process. Uh, the, the, and the big ticket items is the debt service payment, uh, roadway and drainage repairs, uh, some work still to be done on the library, and. Uh, worked within the town office and meeting hall spaces. So, um, but most of everything else are fairly um, nickel and dime stuff. But we are going to get them next year this year. Great. Uh, is there a motion to approve the carry forward balances as amended by Matt just now, removing that one line item? I so move. Second. I'll second that. Councilor Brennan, any discussion? All those in favor? Great. Any citizen comment? No. Great. <laughs> Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Councilor Brennan, seconded by Councilor Caitlin Jordan. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Sean. I already sent an email to IT guys. <laughs> <laughs> but something's just not quite here.